the rattlesnake strikes, sinking its fangs through the furry carapace of the tarantula. It writhes briefly on the golden sands, then goes limp. The desert is a brutal place. Here, it's eat or be eaten. A man walks through a remote desert landscape, a pack on his back. The sun dips down over the horizon, a welcome reprieve from the heat, but bringing its own new threats. The dangers of the day may be gone for now, but the dangers of the night are just beginning. As he walks, he hears a strange sound behind him. He turns, and by the dim light of the moon, he sees a mound of sand advancing toward him, as if blown by a storm, but there's no wind blowing. Frightened, he tries to run, but the dune gains on him until he is completely submerged. After a moment, the sand disperses, revealing nothing left but a skeleton. The dune travels off into the distance, disappearing from view. The desert is an unforgiving place for a traveler. The days are hot and dry, baking you with the relentless heat of the sun. The nights are cold and just as inhospitable as the desert's wild inhabitants come out of hiding, ready to attack any perceived threats or invaders. The year is 1908, and a cavalry troop on their way back to base are getting a crash course in just how brutal the Arizona desert can be. The trip has taken longer than anticipated, and their horses are growing sluggish from thirst, trudging slower and slower through the dust and sand. The soldiers' eyes sting from the sun, the sweat, and the lack of proper sleep. They need a place to hang their hats for the night, to have a hearty meal and a tall glass of water, and maybe something stronger too after all this trouble. As if in answer to their prayers, the men suddenly spotted a faded sign for a town further down the road, only one mile left to Fredericksburg, it said. They would be able to reach the town by sundown, a welcome reprieve from sleeping on the ground and watching their supplies dwindle day by day. The mile seems to stretch on forever, but they persist and reach their oasis, the town of Fredericksburg. They aren't exactly expecting a welcome parade upon their arrival, but they're still shocked by how tepid a reception is waiting for them. Here they are, members of the army cavalry, and no one comes out to greet them or even to see who the strange men in uniform on horses might be. As a matter of fact, the men don't see anyone at all, not one single soul. They stop in the middle of the town square, climbing down from their horses and call out, shouting at the top of their lungs. Still, no doors fling open, no windows are cracked, and no one comes to see what all the commotion was. The only evidence that anyone was ever there at all is the buildings themselves and a few handwritten signs posted throughout the area. The signs are all in German, and none of the soldiers can speak enough German to read them. If they could, they would probably leave the town as quickly as possible, hop on their horses and gallop away until it vanishes from view. But they can't, so they don't. One of the men suggests that the town is abandoned, that it's become a ghost town. The more they see of the town, the more they think he might be right. The buildings are still in good condition, but there's no one inside. It's as if the entire town got up one day and decided to leave it all behind. Then, it sat untouched until the cavalry came. So one of the other men wonders, what should they do? The plan doesn't have to change, another one suggests. A night's sleep in an abandoned town is far better than another night of setting up camp and sleeping on the ground. Near the edge of town, they find a tavern and an adjoining hotel. There may not be any staff or other lodgers, but there's a stable for the horses, plenty of beds, and a few unopened bottles behind the bar. That's more than enough for the night. So they tie up the horses, have a few drinks, sing a few drinking songs, and settle in for what is sure to be the best sleep they've had in many, many days. They're so exhausted and so relieved to find shelter that they don't stop for one moment to wonder what might have caused the residents of Fredericksburg to abandon their homes all at once. Ghost towns don't come out of nowhere after all. Ghosts have to be made. But exhaustion is a powerful thing, and the allure of a soft, if dusty, bed is hard to resist when one's bones are aching and eyelids are growing heavy. So instead of asking questions, they sleep. A deep, blissfully ignorant sleep. A few hours later, one of the men suddenly wakes, jolted from slumber by a horrible high-pitched neigh. One neigh quickly becomes a chorus as more voices join in. The horses, something's wrong. He jumps out of bed and runs down to the stable, expecting to see a rattlesnake or a coyote or perhaps a thief who snuck into town to loot the empty houses, what he finds is far more disturbing than he ever could have anticipated. 
The horses are in a state of sheer panic, stamping their hooves and tossing their heads back, eyes rolling wildly in their sockets. As he attempts to find the source of their terror, the man realizes that there are fewer horses in the stable than there were when the men went to bed. Did the others somehow escape? He turns to inspect the stable and sees seven piles of clean, white bones where there once were horses. One pile of bones for each missing horse. It's impossible, but he's looking at it with his own eyes. Something was in here with the horses. It attacked, and it devoured them whole and left only the bones behind. What sort of creature could have done this? None that he wants to meet, that's for sure. There isn't anything in the stable anymore, no threat that he can see. He needs to get back inside and warn the rest of the men before whatever did this decides to come back. The other soldiers aren't thrilled to be woken up in the middle of the night, and they're even less thrilled when they hear the wild story of what the man saw down there in the stable, but still, they've never seen him so afraid. So they reluctantly pull themselves out of bed, and some of the less bleary-eyed men agree to join him in investigating the situation. While they head down to the stable to look for potential danger, the rest of the men roll back over in bed and close their eyes. No use losing sleep over a situation that's as good as handled. They'll take care of the snake or would-be thief or what have you, and come morning, it'll all be fine anyway. Down at the stable, the horses have calmed down. Whatever preyed on the seven horses reduced to bone, it's gone now. But even though the horses have stilled, the soldiers do not feel comforted. There's still the mystery of what could have done this. They were afraid of what they might find when they came down to investigate, but finding nothing is somehow worse. They were only asleep for a matter of hours before the horses started screaming. What manner of beast or man could have done away with seven horses in that time? There isn't an animal they can conceive of capable of feeding so efficiently. Sure, a wolf can kill quickly, but to kill seven times in a row without a sound, without a fight, and to clean the bones of any speck of meat all without being caught, it seems like the work of something beyond the natural world. One of the more superstitious soldiers, pale and trembling, suggests that the abandoned town must be haunted by a vengeful and hungry spirit. It demanded an offering in exchange for their trespassing here and took the horses as a sacrifice. The others laugh at him, but secretly, they're just as frightened as him. They're supposed to be brave in the face of the unknown, but it's the dead of night in a town with no people, and something is eating the horses. Meanwhile, back in the hotel, many of the other men struggle to get back to sleep. They're exhausted, the remnants of sleep still clouding their eyes and weighing down their heads, but the insistent, nervous pounding of their hearts is keeping them awake. They are suddenly acutely aware of the complete silence that surrounds them. In the dark, they can't hear anything but their own breathing, quick and shallow. Then, suddenly, another sound breaks through the quiet. It's a soft sound, like a tide rushing ashore. Sand on sand, the flow of something, a gentle, scraping sound. What is that? Could it be the wind? Doesn't sound like any wind they've ever heard. For one thing, it's coming from inside the building. For another, it's getting closer. One curious soldier climbs out of bed to seek out the source of the noise. He opens the door to his room, squinting to make out shapes among the shadows. At first, he thinks the motel must be flooding. Something's pouring into the hall, spilling across the floor and flowing closer and closer. But as it approaches, he sees that it isn't water at all. It's sand. He can't see where it's coming from or how it came into the building in the first place, but that doesn't matter. It's slowly filling the building, and more importantly, it seems to be headed straight for him. Instinctively, he jumps back into his room, slamming the door shut to block the flood of sand. But he didn't account for the crack under the door. And as he watches, the sand begins spilling into his room from beneath the door. It moves as if it were alive, creeping across the floor toward him. He scrambles backward, jumping onto the bed to avoid the tide of sand. Still, it advances closer and closer, piling up until it can reach him there. There's no doubt about it, this is no ordinary sand. It isn't just filling the room at the urging of gravity or some sort of indoor storm. It's deliberately creeping, advancing, hunting. He glances around the room, desperate for a means of escape, but there's nowhere to run. The only way out is the door, blocked by the ever-increasing tide of sand. It rises to the height of the bed, spilling onto the mattress and preparing to engulf him. He isn't certain what will happen to him when it does, but he's looked death in the face enough times to recognize it on sight. The sand is covering his feet now, 
climbing up his legs, ready to cover his body and swallow him whole. He opens his mouth to scream, and sand pours through his lips, filling his throat and lungs. He collapses onto the bed under the weight of the assault, and he disappears. One of the sleeping soldiers wakes to the sound of a scream from the next room. He goes to sit up, but finds his arm is strangely heavy. He looks over and is shocked to see that his arm is covered with sand. And the sand is moving, undulating on his arm like a swarm of tiny creatures. He tries to shake them loose, but for some reason, his arm feels paralyzed. With his other hand, he swipes at the sand, brushing it away as quickly as possible to reveal the arm beneath. When he can see it, he wishes he couldn't. Bone, a skeleton hand poking from beneath the sleeve of his nightshirt. He flies into a blind panic, stumbling out of bed, his bone arm dangling useless at his side, and fumbles with the doorknob, desperate to escape. But the sand is relentless, already swarming around his feet and weighing him down. Before he can take a single step out of the room, the swarm of sand overtakes him, and he is buried in a living grave. Throughout the hotel, once thought to be abandoned, but now clearly occupied by something hungry, the men flee their rooms, abandoning belongings to the flood of sand. As they run, they see more and more sand pouring into the walls like waves and waves of water ready to drown them. They pull on their boots to protect their bare feet and sprint as fast as their legs will carry them, jumping and weaving around the piles of sand to avoid being eaten until they make it outside. There, the other men have begun to prepare the horses, the horrified screams from inside having served as a pretty clear indication that it is time to take their leave. As they mount their horses and prepare to flee, they realize that four men are missing from their ranks. One soldier suggests that they run back inside, perform a rescue mission, and try to recover the missing four. But it is obvious that no one wants to step foot back into that sandy den of death. They don't want to leave any men behind, but the choice is between four men and all of them. The sight of another wave of sand pouring through the hotel's door makes up their minds for them, and they climb onto their horses, some riding two men to one horse, and gallop out of Fredericksburg into the night. The four men lost to the sands will never be seen again, joining the rest of Fredericksburg's ghosts. Though it wouldn't be classified for many more years, these unfortunate men had encountered the deadly appetite of SCP-165. SCP-165's organic component resembles a typical parasitic mite, each instance of which is 750 micrometers in length, with eight legs and a genetic structure similar to that of a house dust mite. The main difference between these organisms and the dust mites they resemble is their hermit crab-like tendency to attach grains of sand to their backs for an as-of-yet unknown purpose. The creatures travel as a colony, numbering in the hundreds of billions or even trillions, giving the appearance of a large dune of sand. In spite of their tendency to move as a pack, SCP-165 instances do not cooperate with one another. Instead, they act in competition with each other, fighting over food with an insatiable appetite. Much like mosquitoes, these mites detect their prey by sensing carbon dioxide and sugars in the air. Once this prey has been sniffed out, the mites will use their legs to climb over each other, rolling toward their target until they have enveloped it. The bite of SCP-165 releases a numbing chemical toxin, similar to the toxins found in mosquito and flea bites. The subject will be unable to tell that millions of mites are biting at their flesh until it is far too late. The swarm stripping them down to the bone in minutes. This numbing effect works so well that some victims have been completely devoured in their sleep without ever once waking up. The SCP-165 mites are nearly invulnerable, resistant to all but the deadliest pesticides. They do, however, avoid heat, seeking shade whenever available and being the most active at night. They show a preference for large, sleeping prey. This dislike for heat and apparent vulnerability to it is the most useful method for containing the mites. While investigating the initial discovery of SCP-165 by the SCP Foundation, I discovered an addendum to the official file. Though some portions had been redacted for, I presume, security purposes, I was able to piece together the most relevant information. From what I can surmise, the United States government has been aware of the existence of SCP-165 for at least 80 years. The mites were first discovered in Fredericksburg, Arizona, a forgotten town formerly populated largely by German immigrants. This town is also, I must note, located in the Thule Desert near the Goldwater Air Force bombing range, 
Fredericksburg was founded in the late 1800s, and by 1908, it had become a ghost town. Its sudden, strange emptiness was discovered by a passing cavalry troop, who quickly discovered that there was a reason for the disappearance of Fredericksburg's inhabitants. This much I essentially already knew. What I didn't know, however, is that the United States government attempted to exterminate SCP-165 in the late 1950s. In fact, this goal is attributed to the creation of a bombing range in the area, though I was unable to officially confirm this. The bombing range and its subsequent use was able to successfully reduce the population of SCP-165. However, the explosives were insufficient to completely eradicate the threat. So, in the late 1980s, the SCP Foundation opted to intervene and deploy a ground cleanup and extraction team. Mobile Task Force Epsilon-9, aka Fire Eaters, was dispatched to Fredericksburg to extract and contain SCP-165 by any means necessary. Upon entering the decrepit town, the task force was met with an ominous sight. Vacant buildings lined the streets, left in disrepair but otherwise untouched. The only sign that life was ever there at all was the bones, animal and human alike, littering the dusty ground. One MTF member spotted a sign, hand-lettered in German, reading, Vorsicht vor dem kriechenden hungrigen Sand. Though he didn't speak German, one of his fellow task force members did, and translated it for the others. Beware the creeping, hungry sands. With this ominous warning in mind, MTF Epsilon 9 advanced into a nearby house to investigate. There, they found the floors completely covered with mounds of sand. The untrained eye might just assume that this was ordinary sand, but the task force knew better. These were instances of SCP-165 hiding from the heat and sunlight beneath the shelter of this roof. At the first sign of movement, their suspicions were confirmed and the MTF members produced their flamethrowers, assaulting SCP-165 with blasts of fire until the movement ceased. These measures proved highly successful, melting the sand to glass and repelling whatever mites were not trapped inside. A living dune made up of four metric tons of SCP-165 was contained and transported to ABC Area 14. SCP-165 is contained in a facility at Armed Biocontainment Area 14. SCP-165 is considered to be a contagious, pathological organism, and so containing it requires the highest sterilization and quarantine procedures to be followed. There are microwave field generators placed around SCP-165's containment area in order to restrict the movement of the dune. Once every nine days, the mass of SCP-165 is to be fed at least 750 kilograms of live cattle. Attempts to feed the entities via pre-slaughtered food sources have proven ineffective. For whatever reason, they prefer live prey. Unfortunate for the cows, but the Ethics Committee has proposed that they be sedated prior to feeding time in order to minimize potential suffering. We tend to associate sand with discomfort, whether it's intruding on a day at the beach and wedging itself into the most inconvenient crevices, or sticking to anything and everything placed in its vicinity. As someone once said, it's coarse, it's rough, and it gets everywhere. But if SCP-165 ever breaks containment and spreads to other parts of the country, or even the world, it could do much more harm than some simple irritation. That is, if it isn't already out there. The mites feed so quickly, so efficiently, it's possible they're dwelling in other sandy areas and just haven't been discovered yet. How many small desert towns have they picked to the bone? How many beachside communities have been decimated? I can't say for sure, but I can say this. Next time you take a trip to the shore and decide to feel the sand between your toes, make sure to look down from time to time, just to make sure your toes are still there. It all started with the roses dying. Only the one bush at first. The old man had come out to water his garden the same way he did every morning. It was looking sad and brown, leaves drooping and branches hardening. Just the one bush in the corner. But the next day, the bushes on either side of it had died too. Within a week, it was that whole corner of the garden. As the old man puts on his gardening gloves at the sink and stares out of the kitchen window, he knows that something is seriously wrong with his poor plants. The flourishing garden, so neatly maintained throughout all of his retirement years, his pride and joy, is now steadily dying before his very eyes. Living in a small one-story house, there isn't much left for him to do. Out in Bushy, right on the edge of what could be considered London, there is very little going on with his day. Inside the house, he hangs all of his photos of the Lancaster bomber that he and his squad flew in the Second World War. 
Although those days are long behind him now, he chose to live here because on the hill that his house is on, he can see the planes taking off and landing from the nearby RAF base. And where does he like to sit and watch the planes? From his immaculate garden. The old man scowls at it. The perfectly trimmed hedges, blossoming trees, uniform grass, and colorful beds are all being ruined by a dark stain steadily spreading from the back right corner. Starting with that rose bush in the corner and spreading out, everything in a rough circle measuring close to 15 feet is withering away and dying. Not on his watch. The kettle finishes boiling. He has to use his old gas hobs to heat up the water. The cooker is apparently long past its lifespan. The ignition stopped working years ago, so he has to use matches to start it. If he leaves on the gas by accident, well, there wouldn't be much of a kitchen left. He pours the water out into a mug and starts brewing his morning cup of tea. A few minutes later, the back door slides open and the old man emerges, trowel and cup of tea in hand. Years ago, he would have marched purposefully across the grass, but now he is forced to plod instead. His knees and back are both starting to give out from the years of tending to his precious green friends, but the fire is still in his belly. He reaches the edge of the dead patch and looks down. The lawn isn't just yellowing, it's fully brown. He pokes at the grass with his shoe, and it breaks apart to the touch. How strange, he's never seen anything die off so suddenly and uniformly. It isn't just a bad bed or an infection spreading around, it's a clear patch of death where nothing in the given area stands a chance. He steps onto the brown grass and walks to the corner where that first rose bush died. The base of the fence is rotting away in that corner, giving him a peek into his neighbor's garden. With a good deal of groaning and aching, the old man lowers himself onto his hands and knees and peers under the fence. A pair of eyes meet his. The old man yells out in surprise. The person on the other end screams. After a moment, they look under again and start laughing. It's just the mom from next door. She has kids who like to play in the garden on their trampoline while he's working. They'll often talk over the fence to him between bounces. I hope I didn't give you a hot attack, she teases. He reassures her that he's made of sterner stuff than that. Then they got to the matter at hand. What is going on in their gardens? She's having the same issue too. That same circle is spreading out over her side too. Everything it touches is dying. Well then, has to be coming from this corner, the old man says. A pair of them pull the fence apart around the corner, creating a little hole between their gardens. It's short work. The boards break apart at the lightest touch. Before long, they have a little work site ready. There must be something down in this corner that's causing all of this. Side by side, the old man and the mom from next door start to dig. The soil feels strange to dig through. There's a kind of stickiness to it, as if there's a very faint layer of slime binding it together. Could it be a dead animal? That's the old man's best guess right now, but it doesn't seem very convincing. Surely that would nourish the soil with more nutrients. It might offset the pH balance a bit, but not to the extent of crack. The mom's trowel breaks. She holds it up to her face, confused, the metal shovel scoop has broken, the tip of it has fallen off, half snapped, half melted. I just bought this the other day. But the old man isn't looking at the trowel anymore. Instead, he's staring into the hole that the pair of them have dug. Down there at the bottom, underneath the piece of broken metal, something is moving. He plants a gloved hand on either side of the hole and leans down over it, peering at whatever it is. Worms, tiny brown worms each writhing and wrapping around the others, tying and untying knots. He straightens up with a groan, takes his gloves off, and pushes himself to his feet. We need to call the council. There's something dead down there that's rotten badly. The woman from Hertzmere Council was clearly not very interested in sending a waste disposal team down when the old man called her. She told him they would stop by the bungalow in three to five working days and hung up. Several calls later, she relented and agreed they would send a team across that afternoon. Soon after 4 p.m., a knock comes at the door. The old man escorts the waste disposal team around the side entrance, keen for them not to traipse any mud through the house. Clearly annoyed by this, the two workmen for the council trudge around the side and out into the garden, grumbling about how they have more important things to be getting on with. The old man chooses to ignore them, leading them to the back corner of his garden and pointing down into the hole he and his neighbor had dug just that morning. Only, the hole is empty. What are we looking at here? One of the workmen grunts. It's a good question. There's nothing at the bottom of the hole. No writhing worms, not even the shard of the trowel. It's just an empty hole. The old man kneels back down by the hole and scoops back the dirt of it with his own trowel. Nothing. 
The old man hears words muttered that he hasn't heard since the war as he escorts the two gentlemen back to their van. They slam the doors more heavily than necessary and drive off down the quiet suburban street, leaving the man standing confused on his doorstep. The next day, when he goes out to garden, the circle of death hasn't grown. It still looks bad. The plants inside it are clearly dead, but it hasn't spread any further than it was the previous day. The old man sips his tea over the sink and stares out at the garden. It must have been next door. That would be it. Before the council had shown up yesterday, the mom must have come outside and bagged up whatever dead thing was back there and thrown it out herself. Good. He just hopes it doesn't stink up the bin. Now to do the sad part of the task and clear away all of his dead plants. Those rose bushes had been planted the year he moved in. His wife had planted them. As he dons his gloves, the old man feels a wave of sadness wash over. But before he can experience it too deeply, he notices the holes. The tips of his gloves are gone, his fingers poking clean out. In fact, looking down at his trousers, he notices a pair of holes on the knees of them from where he'd been kneeling in the dirt yesterday. A knock at the front door makes him jump. He goes out to see the mom from next door standing anxiously outside his place. She's glancing up and down the street as she talks. She asks if he's seen either of her boys. He shakes his head, hasn't seen them all day. He reassures her it's probably nothing. Back in his day, boys used to go out of the house first thing in the morning and be back for dinner. Parents these days are too sensitive, too anxious. The look on her face tells him that he isn't helping. She mutters something about having seen someone suspicious walking down the street, someone strange. No use worrying about it for now. She heads off in the direction of the local park to go and look for her sons. The old man calls out to her as she leaves, thanking her for sorting out the dead animal from the end of the garden. She looks back at him, confused. She hadn't touched it. All the rest of the day, the old man stands by his curtains, twitching them open every now and then to peer out and see if the boys are anywhere to be seen. He's locked all of his doors and left the keys under his pillow, but sunset comes and goes. Nighttime creeps over the suburbs, no children in sight. He's just about to go to bed when he spots someone in the corner of the street. Just outside the glow from the streetlights, the figure lurks over by the street sign. The person moves strangely, taking shaky footsteps and seeming to move slightly aimlessly around the pavement, avoiding the light. He opens the curtain wider and peers outside. His eyes definitely aren't what they used to be. He can't really make out who the person is at all. The safe thing to do is stay inside. A man of his age should make sure not to get involved. But the photo of him standing by his Lancaster on the wall tells him something different. The old man straightens up as best he can and walks over to the front door. He doesn't take a weapon with him. He won't need one. He will go over and talk to this gentleman, ask him what he's doing hanging around this neighborhood at night, and if things go poorly, he'll walk back inside and promptly call the police. The thrill of the confrontation excites him a little. He's missed this. As the cold night air blows against his face, he feels his youthful energy returning to him once again. He calls out to the man on the corner. The shadowy figure stops pacing and slowly turns around to get a better look at him. The old man can tell even from this distance that the gentleman on the street is a good deal taller than him, but that shouldn't matter much. He'll go over, have some stern words, and that'll be that. If this strange man knows anything, it'll be that he should respect his elders. The old man crosses the road and stands under the streetlight just a few feet away from the man. Frustratingly, his eyes still can't quite make out the man's face. The old man clears his throat and rolls up his sleeves. Sir, this is a residential neighborhood with young children and an excellent relationship with local law enforcement. I would advise you to move along or we'll be forced to call the authorities. But the sound that greets the old man is enough to immediately do away with any of his bravado. His blood runs cold as the figure in front of him starts to laugh. It is a gruff, rasping noise with a slight squelching underneath it. Come to think of it, every little movement this figure makes, there's a little squelch. The laugh stops suddenly, sharply. The figure turns the rest of the way around to face the old man head on. It takes a step forward. Light falls across it, revealing a mass of wriggling, convulsing worms. Millions of small brown worms all weaving in and out of one another, dripping a thick and sticky liquid under the street. The creature has no face, no features, no skin, nothing. It has the shape of a man, but that is where the resemblance ends. It is utterly inhuman, utterly terrifying. The old man almost topples backward in surprise, but steadies himself. A fall at his age would be very bad news indeed. The creature reaches out a writhing arm toward him. Liquid drips from it onto the sidewalk. A small puff of gas comes up from it as the liquid bubbles, burning a little dent into the stone. So that's what was killing his roses. 
Fast as he can, the old man turns and hurries back to his house. He doesn't want to turn around for risk of losing his balance. He'll get inside, lock the door, and call the police. They will know precisely what to do. That squelching sound is behind him, taking shaky, inhuman steps to follow him. The old man reaches the front door and slams it shut. He grabs the landline in the hallway and immediately dials 999, the British emergency number. Hello? Uh, police, please. There's a gentleman loitering outside my domicile. He appears to be made of worms. Worms, yes. No, no medication. I'm just myself. There's a thud at the door, then a second thud. The old man drops the receiver and takes a few steps back. No more thuds. No more noises. Maybe that was a slight overreaction. The old man straightens up and clears his throat. Nothing to worry about. A sizzling sound fills the hallway. The door starts to look strange. Two patches are appearing on it, the paint cracking and discoloring. The patches start to bulge outwards, and a drop of liquid seeps through. It falls on the welcome mat and burns a hole clean through it. The old man's eyes widen. Worms. Just two or three at first, then a few more, then a dozen more, burrow their way through the door, each dripping with that foul liquid. The holes grow larger and larger until the creature has two large armholes burnt clear through the wood. The creature grips what remains of the door with its wormed fingers and wrenches the wood apart. It towers over the old man as it stands in the doorway, its surface crawling and wriggling as its feet burn holes into the carpet. The book hits the creature square in the chest, knocking it off balance. The old man throws another book and another. He knew it was a good idea to keep his bookshelf out in the hallway. He grabs another, but hesitates and puts it back, not the first editions. Instead, he heaves the old yellow pages in both of his hands and launches it as hard as he can at the worm monster. The book smacks into its chest with enough force to break a chunk of it apart. The creature's chest bursts open, sending worms flying through the air. Something red falls out onto the carpet. A baseball cap. A child's baseball cap, half digested. The old man gasps and puts a hand to his mouth. The worms splattered against the wall start to slide down towards the carpet, eating through the wallpaper as they go. Once on the ground, they start to crawl and wriggle back over to their body, reabsorbing into the mass from the feet. The creature straightens up like nothing ever happened. He's going to need more than books. Hello? It's the mom from next door. The old man's eyes widen further. I saw your door was still open. I was just wondering if you've seen... The mom appears in the front doorway just behind the monster, takes one look up at it, and freezes. She has a rusty old zippo with a dim flame to light her way. The wormed mass turns round to her. In the same rasping voice that it laughed with earlier, it says one word. Her name. Then it notices something and flinches slightly, the lighter in her hand. For a second, the old man, the mom from next door, and the giant worm monster all look at the tiny little flame. Then it goes out. The creature lunges at her, grabbing her by the shoulders and wrenching her into a ferocious hug. The smell of dissolving flesh fills the hallway as she screams in agony. The old man does everything he can not to throw up. He needs to get out of the house. The back door, he'll go out the back while the creature eats. Step by step, he creeps away from the distracted monstrosity next to his coat rack, trying his best not to be heard. He slides the kitchen door closed and puts a chair against the handle. It's not much, but it'll buy him a few seconds. He turns, rushing to the glass sliding doors at the back of the house, and reaches for the key on the side. Only, it's gone. Of course, he left all the keys under his pillow. The pillow in the bedroom that's right next to… His shoulders slump. He turns back around and sees a crack of light under the kitchen door. A couple of worms are crawling their way under it, gathering together and starting to form on the tiles. That's it then. It's all over. Nothing left for it. The old man lets his eyes wander around the room. That creature is making its way into this kitchen no matter what he does. All he has are a few precious seconds until those worms are big enough to come after him. He wants to spend those seconds the right way. Feeling his ragged breathing starting to find a steadier rhythm, he walks over to that old picture on the wall. Him and his crew, all his best friends, standing young and proud in front of their bomber. He'd experienced this feeling before, this moment. When you know that your demise is guaranteed, it removes some of the panic. The uncertainty of, will I make it? What can I do? Do I have a chance? It's a sickly thing. It leaves you in the lurch, trying desperately to battle against your own nerves. Once it's decided, however, well, then everything becomes a lot clearer. He'd felt this way in the war, when their bomber was shot at while flying over occupied France. 
They were steadily losing altitude and airspeed as they crossed back over the channel. The seven of them had each taken a quiet moment to say their prayers and look out at the stars flitting above them. Only, they hadn't died. In fact, they were all being incredibly foolish. The solution was so simple that when the old man's rear gunner suggested they just drop all their remaining bombs onto the water to save weight, the group of them had all burst out laughing. One by one, the bombs dropped silently into the sea. They're probably still down there to this day. No explosions. Explosions. The old man smiles. Maybe it's not quite over after all. He looks back at the ball of worms assembling on his kitchen floor. As more worms crawl under the door and join the mass, it takes on different strange shapes. First a mouse, then a rabbit, a cat, dog. In a moment, it'll be the size of a hog. Rushing over to his gas stovetop, he twists all four of the dials all the way up. They whine and hiss at him, spewing acrid-smelling gas into the air. Already his head starts to swim. He'll have to time this just right. He snatches the trowel and a box of matches up off the countertop and goes to the sliding glass door. This is it. Rasping laughter fills the room as the creature stands to its full height, head almost brushing against the ceiling. The old man can feel himself losing consciousness from all the gas in the room. Bang! He slams the trowel against the glass door. Nothing. Bang! He does it again, still hopeless. The laughter grows louder as he hears squelching footsteps behind him. Bang! This time there's a slight chip. He hits it again and again, trying his best to shatter it. But while the little chip grows into a crack, it's not working. A warm, squishy mass smothers his shoulder. Worms burrow into his flesh, searing white-hot pain throughout his body. That'll have to do. The old man strikes the match. Boom! Glass shatters, flames bloom out of the house, licking the last remaining healthy flowers. Burning worms fly in all different directions, scattered across the lawn, the back fence, and beyond. The old man thuds onto his back, looking up at the billowing smoke making its way up towards the stars as the scared worms burrow their way back into the ground. He would never understand the monster that attacked him that night. Thankfully, this is where I come in. There is something about fire that unlocks this primal fear in almost all living creatures, and SCP-906 is no different. Nicknamed the Scouring Hive, SCP-906 is the blanket designation for a supercolony of worm-like invertebrates that appear to share a semi-advanced hive mind. The individual worms are dark brown in color and appear to have some level of shared intelligence. When separated from the colony, the worms will crawl towards its general direction but demonstrate a reduced level of problem-solving capabilities. However, once they are back as part of the group, the Scouring Hive is a formidable predator. When hungry, this SCP becomes acutely aggressive, secreting a viscous, highly corrosive acid that can eat through flesh, hair, bones, and clothing alarmingly quickly. Capable of adapting its form to mimic other animals and humans, this SCP seems to find a level of thrill in the chase. Able to parrot a very rudimentary estimation of human speech, it can say names and even laugh, which it often does while pursuing its prey. It is theorized that this ability to impersonate others is used to lure subjects into dangerous situations, like young children playing alone in their garden hearing a strange noise from over the fence. While it can take various forms, the scouring hive is at its most lethal when it chooses to attack directly. Taking the form of a kind of carpet of worms, it flows across the ground quickly, climbing surfaces, squeezing through narrow gaps, and finding creative solutions to stalk otherwise inaccessible targets. It has been known to swarm through various circuitous routes like drain pipes and air vents while on the hunt. Once it has reached its prey, it envelops them, coating them in that acidic secretion that rapidly breaks down living tissue into a slurry for the worms to consume. While it is unclear whether this is a genuine reaction or just another instance of parroting, this SCP seems to enjoy gloating at this stage, laughing at and mocking its prey as it consumes it. How a colony of worms has reached this level of cognition is unknown. While tougher than your average garden worms, the scouring hive is not invincible. Susceptible to incineration, freezing, and full-body disintegration, SCP-906 can be neutralized if the need should ever arise. When under existential threat, the colony will begin to undergo a period of rapid reproduction. As long as just a handful of worms survive, the colony is able to rebuild itself quickly. That is why SCP-906 is currently held in secure storage in a 3x3 meter fully airtight acid-resistant box. It is kept at a constant 5 degrees Celsius. At this cool temperature, SCP-906 operates at a much reduced capacity. 
consuming less food, reproducing at a reduced rate, and moving slowly. Should that temperature ever increase, all SCP personnel are to evacuate immediately and ready themselves to terminate any worms they see with flamethrowers and liquid nitrogen. A truck pulls up in front of a quiet suburban home. The faded sign on the truck's flank reads, Exterminator. It's not the most glamorous job, but hey, someone's gotta do it. In all his years of extermination work, this exterminator has seen it all. Ants, termites, rats, but he's never taken a job that he couldn't handle. As he looks out at this sprawling suburban home, he can't help but notice the nicely manicured lawn and the beautifully sculpted topiaries. The trash cans are neatly stacked on the curb, ready for pickup. It doesn't look like the sort of home that would have a vermin problem. But then again, this exterminator knows better than anyone that looks can be deceiving. People often think that only run-down slums will attract vermin, but he knows that even the cleanest kitchens can still have a problem with unwelcome invaders. He jumps from his truck and walks up to the front door, carrying his equipment on his back and a clipboard in his hands. He quickly reviews the specifics of this job from the paper on his clipboard. A woman called his company complaining about a major cockroach infestation, demanding that they send someone right away. He remembers that she sounded downright frantic on the phone, much more agitated than you would expect from a little cockroach problem. Then again, he thinks, some people just really don't like bugs. He rings the doorbell and waits. A crabby-looking old woman answers the door. It's about time that you got here, she snaps. There's a huge cockroach infestation in the basement, hundreds of them. I want you to go down there and do something about it. Absolutely, ma'am, says the exterminator politely. Part of his job is assuaging frantic customers. He's used to this sort of thing. So many homeowners are absolutely terrified of insects that they fall to pieces at the sight of a spider or a cockroach. He's accustomed to dealing with all manner of creepy crawlies, so he's not at all worried. He's sure this will be an easy job. You're in good hands with us. We'll kill those roaches dead, he says, recalling the company slogan that he's required to repeat. They're in the basement, says the old woman. I've tried to kill them, but there's too many of them, and they're too fast. I'm way too old to be running after a bunch of bugs. It tires these old bones out. I was down there with a spray can myself, but I just keep getting too tired to keep it up. It's almost like those bugs were making me sleepy. Of course, ma'am. The exterminator can barely keep from rolling his eyes as this old woman continues to rattle off complaints about the cockroaches in her basement. Of course, there's an easy explanation for all of this. This woman is very old, so she wouldn't be able to run around much without tiring herself out. That's much more plausible than believing that the cockroaches were somehow magically draining her energy. But again, he's used to listening to all sorts of crazy stories from frightened clients, so he doesn't give it much thought. Then I'll take a look and see what kind of problem you have. The exterminator opens the door to the basement and peers down into the darkness. He gropes blindly for the light switch, and eventually his fingers connect. He flips the switch, and a bare light bulb hanging from the ceiling flickers on. The stairs leading down into the depths of the basement are warped and rickety. He makes a mental note to watch his step as he descends. The boards ominously creak under his feet. The basement is filled with junk, all the accumulated debris of the owner's whole life. He sees piles of cardboard boxes overflowing with old books and raggedy clothes. Paint cans are stacked in the corner in defiance of any pretensions to fire safety. The boiler rattles and wheezes. It sounds like it might need to be replaced fairly soon. The air smells damp and musty, and he wonders if the old woman has ever cleaned this basement. Looking at this mess, it's no wonder that she would have a problem with cockroaches. The exterminator can't help but think about how messy and decrepit this cellar looks compared to the immaculate facade of the house outside. The exterminator pulls out his flashlight and flicks it on. He aims it into the corners, hoping to see some evidence of this insect invasion. He sees nothing. The old woman described a basement infested with hordes of insects, yet he doesn't see a single one. He stifles a yawn. Why does he feel so sleepy? This job must be more draining than he thought, because he's already feeling spent. Could it be that the old woman was right? Is there something in the basement that is making him sleepy? Could it be something about those cockroaches that she blames? No, that's just ridiculous. He knows enough about cockroaches to know that can't be the case, and he's not about to start believing fantasies now. He's a rational guy. He knows that you can't lose your head and expect to do well in this line of work. Besides, he reminds himself, he still hasn't actually seen any evidence of a cockroach problem at all. He continues to poke around the basement and still finds nothing. He frowns. This is really concerning. First of all, he doesn't relish the idea of explaining to the old woman upstairs that she doesn't actually have a cockroach problem at all. She's probably not going to take kindly to him telling her that she is delusional. But also, he was hoping that this would be a big job. If he can't find any bugs, he won't be able to justify charging the old woman for this visit. What a waste of his time. Suddenly, he catches movement out of the corner of his eye. 
He spins around, aiming his flashlight into the corner, just quick enough to see something scuttle through a crack in the wall. Did he imagine that? No, he tells himself. He definitely saw something. Great. He approaches the corner, his spirit suddenly buoyed again. He's happy that he'll actually have something to report to his upstairs client. Maybe he'll find a whole nest in that crack. That would be great. He could justify recommending a full house fumigation then, and that would bring some much needed cash into the business. He narrows his eyes and peers closer. Even with his flashlight being trained on the crack, it's so dark in the basement that it's hard to see. He can see the wooden boards of the house's superstructure through the flaking paint on the wall and, if he squints just right, he thinks he can just see something squirming right there between the boards. Whatever it is, it stops moving when his flashlight beam washes over it. That's very unusual. He knows from experience that when you turn over a rock, bugs will always race for cover. They aren't smart enough to play dead, yet that's exactly what it looks like this insect is doing. He rubs his eyes with his free hand, trying to blink away his sudden sleepiness. He's feeling even drowsier than before, but he really needs to finish this job. He moves in closer, and the cockroach decides to make a break for it. The insect skitters away, desperately trying to worm its little gray body between the boards to escape. The exterminator moves fast. He pulls a pair of tweezers from his pocket and pinches them closed on the squirming insect's abdomen before it can wriggle away. He holds it up close to his nose so that he can get a better look at his prey. The exterminator laughs. He's seen every kind of insect in his time and he can recognize a cockroach when he sees it. This is no cockroach. He can tell from a glance that he's looking at a perfectly harmless cricket. Like so many people, that old woman must have just panicked at the sight of a bug and assumed it was a cockroach. That's good. Most people don't mind having crickets in their home, so this old lady will probably be happy to hear the news. Then again, is it a cricket? When he looks closer, he sees that it's got some unusual features. There are strange barbed hooks visible on the underside of its abdomen, sharp enough that even an experienced exterminator like him thinks better of holding this thing too close to his face. Are those stingers? Could this bug be poisonous? And even stranger, if he looks closer, he thinks he might even see metal wires protruding from its exoskeleton. The exterminator yawns again, rubbing his eyes. He suddenly feels so sleepy. What's wrong with him? Did he not get enough sleep last night? I should have had a second cup of coffee this morning, he tells himself. Why can't I keep focused? His words trail off as, all at once, sleep overtakes him. He collapses to the floor with a thud, dropping his tweezers. The cricket bounces free as the tweezers fall from his hands. The cricket drops to the floor and quickly rights itself. Instead of running, though, the tiny insect turns around. It skitters toward the prone form of the exterminator, making a straight line for his head as if it were moving with intelligent purpose. This doesn't look like the frantic, stimulus response movements of an insect. The insect crawls over the slumbering man's face, hoisting itself over his chin, then lips, and then right up to his left nostril. With one sudden movement, the cricket slithers up his nose and disappears. The exterminator snorts and mumbles in his sleep, but the sensations of an insect wriggling up his nose does nothing to rouse him from his sleep. After a few minutes, the exterminator blinks his eyes open. He sits up with a groan and rubs his head. What the hell just happened? Did he pass out? How embarrassing. He looks around, finding his tweezers and his flashlight on the ground next to him. But no matter where he looks, he can't see the insect anymore. Where did it go? He returns to the crack in the wall for a second look, but sees nothing. Absently, the exterminator rubs his nose. He feels a vague discomfort in his sinuses, and he wonders if maybe his allergies are acting up but otherwise he remembers nothing about his bizarre experience. He probes his fingers into the crack and wiggles them around, hoping to find some evidence of the missing insect. There's nothing there. Well, at least he knows what he's dealing with, and it's definitely no cockroach. Eventually, he shrugs his shoulders helplessly and returns upstairs. Did you find the cockroaches? Asks the old woman when he returns to the top of the stairs. I know there are roaches down there. He shakes his head. Ma'am, I searched the whole basement and I didn't find any cockroaches. He explains to her that all he could find in the basement was a harmless cricket. The old woman starts to argue with him, insisting that what she saw in her basement was no cricket, but the exterminator has already made up his mind. This is annoying. He thought that she would be happy to hear that she doesn't have roaches, but now she just wants to make a fuss. He's not going to waste any more time on this nonsense, not when he has real work to do. He shakes his head as he repacks his equipment and prepares to leave. The exterminator returns to his truck and turns the ignition. As he pulls away, his mind is already mulling his next job. He doesn't give another thought to this crabby old woman and her paranoia about cockroaches. He doesn't stop to wonder what became of that strange cricket that he found. It probably just crawled back into the wall, he thinks. He certainly would have no reason to think that the cricket is still with him, a new and permanent hitchhiker inside his head. 
the exterminator had just acquired a new lifelong friend. A lifelong friend that we call SCP-2119. SCP-2119 is a biomechanical creature that resembles a small gray insect, ranging from 5 to 15 millimeters in length, with a segmented body, six jointed legs, and protrusions from the head and abdomen that resemble antennae and ovipostors respectively. However, SCP-2119 does not appear to reproduce by any means known to man, so these ovipostors are likely simply a form of mimicry, something added to give SCP-2119 the appearance of a common insect to make it less conspicuous to humans. Genetic testing has determined that the organic parts of SCP-2119 are largely identical to those of Gryllus rubens, otherwise known as the southwestern field cricket. One notable difference between SCP-2119 and the field cricket, though, is that SCP-2119, also known as the transmitting parasite, has six barbed hooks on the underside of its body. Strangely, SCP-2119 also contains mechanical parts, including silicon parts that do not match any known make and platinum wiring leading Foundation researchers to assume that SCP-2119 is an artificial life form. At this moment, who made SCP-2119 and why remains a mystery. In many ways, SCP-2119 not only looks like a normal insect, but also acts like one. It apparently possesses extremely rudimentary self-awareness and intelligence comparable to that of its insect brethren, being able to sense potential hosts or detect danger. It displays many normal self-preservation instincts common to insect life. If discovered by a conscious human, it will flee or hide, but it does possess one self-defense measure that no normal insect does. Any human who comes into the proximity of SCP-2119 will start to feel drowsy, eventually succumbing to unconsciousness within 3 to 8 minutes. Once a human subject is unconscious, SCP-2119 will enter their head, either through the nostrils or the ear canal, and eventually make its way to the subject's brain, where it will use its barbed hooks to attach itself to the corpus callosum which are the nerve fibers that permit communication between the left and right side of the brain. The human subject will gradually wake up with no memory of the event. After waking, the subject will return to their normal routine and continue living just as if they were unaffected. It does not appear that infection with the transmitting parasite causes any physical, mental, or psychological damage to hosts or impairs their daily lives in any way. All attempts to physically remove SCP-2119 from a host's brain have so far resulted in the death of the host as SCP-2119 appears to have some way of halting a host's brain activity when it's threatened. Once a host is dead, SCP-2119 will exit the host's head, again either via the nostrils or ear canal, when it determines that no other humans are in the area. Once SCP-2119 has taken up residence in a host's brain, it will start broadcasting a 514.1875 MHz radio signal with a range of approximately 3 kilometers, consisting of a tone lasting 0.05 seconds at 2 second intervals, possibly with the intent of locating other infected human hosts. Once a connection has been established, specimens will transmit a continuous stream of tones of variable lengths between instances, ranging from 70 Hz to 1305 Hz, with wavelengths ranging from 480 cm to 25 cm. Foundation personnel have so far been unable to discern any pattern in the signal, so it is unknown if it is a form of communication or simply random. Most insidious of all, SCP-2119 seems able to spontaneously manifest inside human brains without entering through the ear or nose. Humans coming into the proximity of an infected host have a 14% chance of spontaneously manifesting an instance of SCP-2119 in their own brains. Since SCP-2119 has no visible means of reproduction, exactly how it does this continues to baffle Foundation scientists. SCP-2119 specimens are stored individually in hermetically sealed tanks composed of RF-shielded glass and only removed for testing. Tests are to be conducted in hermetically sealed chambers composed of steel-reinforced concrete walls to block SCP-2119's radio transmissions. All personnel handling specimens of SCP-2119 are required to wear Level 3 hazardous material suits to protect them from infection. SCP-2119 was recently updated from the Euclid to Keter designation after a peculiar incident where all known hosts suddenly ceased all movement, respiration, and brain activity, effectively dying. After 7 minutes and 12 seconds, the subjects revived with no ill effects from their apparent deaths and no memory of the incident. During the 7 minute interval though, the transmitting parasites ceased broadcasting their usual static noises and instead broadcast what appears to have been a casual workplace conversation between two technicians working for whatever entity manufactures SCP-2119. All subjects infected with SCP-2119 
began to emit a strange scraping noise from their throats, which agents later determined was the sound of a chair being dragged across concrete. After this, subjects broadcast a conversation between two technicians who appeared to be oblivious to the fact that their words were being transmitted. During this conversation, the two technicians complained about a person named Reich, whom the Foundation assumes might be their supervisor, and afterwards, one of the two was heard asking for and then drinking a can of Coca-Cola. The broadcast abruptly ended when one of the two technicians suddenly noticed that they were live and cut the feed. The name Reich is so far the Foundation's only clue as to who or what is manufacturing SCP-2119, but so far all investigations into determining Reich's identity have been unsuccessful. It is currently impossible to estimate how many people in the general population are infected with SCP-2119, but considering how contagious the parasite is, it is thought to be extremely widespread. Without any known means of deactivating SCP-2119 without killing its host, containment of SCP-2119 is impossible. Who knows, you might already be infected yourself. It's not as if you would notice. The 13-year-old boy gets a running start before leaping across from one moss-covered boulder to another. He barely makes the jump and turns around to admire how far he leaped. He continues along through the woods, hopping over streams and making sure to swing on any hanging vines he can find, whether he needs to or not. He picks up a branch and starts to swing it against a tree, engaging in a life-and-death duel with the evil knight of the woods. After slaying the knight, the boy solemnly salutes his fallen foe before mounting his trusty steed to ride deeper into the forest. He's all alone out here and must be thousands of miles from civilization. The valiant knight unmounts from his horse and walks towards the culmination of his quest, the Tree of Lost Memories. Legend tells that anything buried beneath this tree will cease to exist. All memories of anything associated with the object buried will disappear from the minds of anyone involved, and no one will ever bring them up again or wonder where the memories went. The knight takes a letter sealed with wax from where he was keeping it safely inside of his armor and kneels in front of the tree. He brushes the leaves and dirt away from a spot near the base of the tree and digs a small hole with his hands before placing the letter inside the hole. The boy looks down at the letter, satisfied with his work. He starts covering the letter inside the hole with dirt, when he suddenly stands up. Was that a noise? He listens again. It's not just a noise, it's a voice. The knight unsheathes his sword and starts making his way in the direction he can hear the sounds coming from. He follows a game trail through the woods towards the noise. There's no doubt, it's definitely a voice, and he can make it out clearly now. The wheel of history turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. The knight rounds a corner, and the woods open up into a clearing. In the middle of the grassy open area is a stone archway unconnected to any walls. When looking through the archway, though, one doesn't simply see the other side of the clearing. No, inside the archway is a beautiful white alabaster castle perched on rock overlooking the sea, its red-roofed turrets jutting high up into the clouds. And standing next to the archway that seems to lead to another land is an old man dressed in a long flowing robe, a wizard's robe. The boy steps out of the woods into the clearing. What is this old man doing out here? And what's going on with this archway? It really does look like it is showing something it shouldn't be able to. Legends fade to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. Are you talking to me? The boy asks. Venture forth and face your true calling, the wizard responds. You are the one that has been prophesied, but have you what it takes to enter this land of adventure? The boy looks around. There's no one else here. This old man must be speaking to him, right? The boy tosses his stick to the ground and steps closer to the old man in the archway. He can see now that the surface of the archway appears to be shimmering, as if it were a vertical surface of water. Only the truest of hearts may enter the magical archway, but for the fair and brave, a great quest awaits. A quest? For me? The boy asks, but again, the old man doesn't respond. He doesn't seem to be looking at him either. Is this wise old man in the woods blind? The boy gets much closer now, close enough to wave his hand in front of the old man's face, but there's no reaction. He really must be blind. The boy looks back at the portal in the archway. He can see the waves breaking on the rocks and birds flying in the sky. He can even make out 
up in one of the highest windows on the tallest tower, what looks to be a... a girl. She's waving her ribbon in the air. She's beckoning him. She needs the brave knight to come save her. Pursue your destiny and become the hero you were always meant to be. The boy is entranced by the beauty of this land, the castle, the clouds drifting between the white towers, the perfectly blue sea, and the beautiful princess locked in her tower, waiting for him. The boy reaches his hand through the surface of the archway, and it passes through as if nothing were there. But on the other side, it turns into the gauntleted hand of a knight. He pulls his hand back out, and it looks like his own hand once again. The boy thinks about his mother, yelling at him for drawing pictures of the lands he wished he could live in when he should be studying. He thinks of his teacher grabbing the fantasy book out of his hand and dropping it in the trash, calling it a waste of time. He thinks of his friends laughing when he came to school dressed as a knight. He knew he was destined for something greater. And here it finally is. He really is a knight. He's the hero that was prophesied. He will become a legend. He's special. The knight girds himself and steps forward into the archway. As he does, he hears the old man still talking. The wheel of history turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that... The boy passes through the archway, and the castle, the sea, the princess, all of them disappear in an instant. The boy spins around, but the archway constricts, snapping shut in a tight ball with him still inside. The old man sinks to the ground as the archway seems to rotate, the archway then also disappears into the earth as something else emerges. A giant centipede appears out of the ground, its scaly body the color of stone with movable plates on its posterior end that resembles the movement of cloth. The centipede opens its mouth, and there's a sound like the cry of a child before it dives down and disappears under the dirt. Have you ever thought that you were destined for something more? Do you feel as if the worlds described in fantasy books and that are brought to life in movies and in video games are somehow the places you actually belong? You're far from alone, but be careful, because it's exactly those thoughts that make you the prime target for SCP-4310, a deadly predator that preys on those with the desire to embark on a hero's journey. SCP-4310 is an anomalous creature that resembles a common centipede in many ways, though it has a number of traits that distinguish it from the kind you might find under a rock in the forest. Perhaps most obvious is its size. While some centipedes can grow as long as a foot, SCP-4310 is over 20 feet in length. This massive carnivorous centipede, which is native to Great Britain and Ireland, also has a hunting method that is quite distinct from any arthropod, insect, or known animal at all for that matter. SCP-4310 hunts by cocooning itself in a pair of keratin flaps that cover its entire body except for its tail end, which is left exposed. The centipede then buries itself in the ground, keeping its head and the majority of its body under the ground, except for a portion that arcs above the ground in a semicircle shape, as well as its exposed posterior. The centipede's end resembles an old man wearing robes, and the centipede is able to manipulate its rear legs in a way that resembles the movement of a mouth and jaw giving the impression that the old man is speaking. The rest of its body is contorted, and the legs are arranged in such a way to resemble a stone archway standing unsupported on the ground next to the old man. Through a process that is yet to be understood by the Foundation, the centipede is able to produce a spatial anomaly in the area where its body is taking on the form of an archway. This spatial anomaly is actually a portal of sorts, a portal that leads directly into SCP-4310's stomach. As soon as its prey enters the spatial anomaly, the centipede closes the portal. Inside, paralysis-inducing enzymes incapacitate the prey as powerful stomach acids break down its meal over the course of several days. You may be thinking, I would never walk into an archway next to an old man in the middle of the forest, but SCP-4310 has two powerful mechanisms perfectly suited to luring its prey. First, it is capable of emitting a pheromone that induces a state of mild euphoria, while at the same time, suppressing fear and encouraging curiosity. This appears to affect all warm-blooded mammals, but humans and their natural inclination towards exploration makes them especially vulnerable to the effects. The second method 4310 utilizes to acquire food is producing a very unique set of sounds. These sounds, which are made by rubbing together portions inside of its tail segments, resemble English speech and are almost always phrases that describe quests, prophecies, and heroic deeds that can only be undertaken by journeying into the archway. 
SCP-4310 calls can last for as long as three minutes before they begin to repeat the series of heroic phrases, and each instance of SCP-4310 appears to have its own unique set of calls to embark on adventure, but with all encouraging entrance into the archway. It is unknown just how SCP-4310 learns these phrases, since other than this advanced hunting technique, no instance of the anomalous creature has shown intelligence levels above that of an ordinary centipede. Interestingly, the same heroic speech sounds appear to also act as SCP-4310's mating call, and it is unknown if the luring of would-be adventurers by the noises is merely a lucky byproduct or if it specifically uses the sounds for both mating and eating. SCP-4310 became known to the SCP Foundation in the 1950s following an investigation into multiple missing persons in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Agents searched a nearby forest and soon discovered human teeth in animal droppings concentrated around a wooded grotto. The grotto was excavated, and three instances of SCP-4310 were found hibernating beneath the ground. It's since been learned that after eating their fill, SCP-4310 will enter a hibernation state that can last as long as 10 years, and it appeared that these three instances ate well, since the remains of over 70 children were eventually found in the immediate area. SCP-4310 has been classified as Euclid, and currently, one instance is kept in a containment cell for observation and testing. The cell has been filled with a thick layer of soil resembling that found in the temperate forests of Great Britain, and once per week, five piglets are introduced into the centipede's enclosure. Mobile Task Force Lambda-12, codenamed Pest Control, is dispatched to areas where there are reports of old men resembling wizards encouraging people to step through a magical archway, and the MTF agents are to exterminate any instances that they find in the wild. The Foundation's Department of Analytics also monitors all contemporary British children's and young adult literature, especially the fantasy genre, for references to portals in the woods that lead to wondrous locations, and Lambda-12 is alerted to any that may be inspired by, or referencing, real SCP-4310 instances. All of us fantasize from time to time about embarking on an epic quest that will allow us to escape our regular lives. While it is fun to dream about being swept off to another world, be very careful if you meet an old man in the woods who tells you that your quest begins with stepping through a magical archway, or you might just find that your hero's journey starts and ends in the belly of a giant centipede. The car screeches to a halt, the door swings open, and the doctor tumbles out. He lands on his hands and knees in the dirt and throws up the few remaining drops of stomach acid left in his system. He's put his hand in something sticky. He can feel an insect wriggling under his palm. Behind him, the door slams, and a pair of boots walk around to his side of the car. The translator accompanying him does not offer a hand to help him up. It had been a long car journey with many similar stops. Fortunately, this was the last. The doctor gingerly gets to his feet and takes in his surroundings. He finds himself in a small village hidden amongst thick trees. He's not sure what time it is anymore. The flights, time zones, and car journeys wrought havoc on his circadian rhythms. He knows he is in China, somewhere very remote and very rural. He tried to look it up with the maps on his phone during the journey, but he'd lost signal a long time ago. One thing is clear, however. It is the middle of the night. The car's headlights are the only light source in the village. No one comes out to greet them. The doctor brushes himself off and turns to his translator. The man nods towards a small hut near the back of the village, just beyond the headlight's reach. His translator is a man of few words, both ironic and deeply unhelpful. The doctor does not know a word of Mandarin himself. In silence, the two men approach the hut. The doctor reaches out to knock, but his translator has already pushed the door open. Inside, there is just the dim light of a lamp. Almost everything is covered in shadow. It is almost dark enough that they can't see the cobwebs. Almost. Silken strings drape themselves over every surface, wall, and item in the little hut. It's impossible in places to even see what item of furniture is hiding beneath all of the webs. The translator reaches out to touch one of the webs in fascination, but the doctor grabs his hand, shaking his head. He hands the translator a face mask and a pair of disposable gloves. Annoyed, the translator takes them, but does not put them straight on, choosing instead to walk deeper into the hut. After a second, the doctor follows, only he can't help the feeling that something's not right. Something's missing. Here, says the translator. It is the first word he said in hours. He's standing behind a little curtain looking down at something, as the doctor joins him there and almost retches from the stench. Lying in the bed is an emaciated man. He looks like he hasn't eaten in days, 
His wrists and ankles are bound tightly to the bed, so tightly, in fact, that his circulation has been cut off. The doctor can see right away the telltale signs of gangrene spreading across his palms. But they're too late. The man isn't moving. His bony chest isn't rising or falling. Worst of all, he must have been dead for a while now. There are sheets of spiderwebs draped over his sallow skin, like some kind of deathly funeral shroud. The translator mutters something in Mandarin. It doesn't take a PhD to pick up on the evident frustration in his voice. A whole night of driving out to the middle of nowhere for nothing. The translator kicks over a wooden stool. The sound is muffled by the thick layer of cobwebs as he storms out of the hut. But something is wrong here. The doctor can't walk out just yet. Toxicology. That's his field. Poisons, toxins, infections, bites. But that's the thing. There are no bites anywhere on this man's body. Head to toe, under the layer of spider silk, there are no welts, bruises, or puncture marks. The only darkened veins standing out are on his fingertips as they rot away from stagnant blood. Nothing to do with poisons. But there's something else, too. A hut holding a dead body, full of spider's webs. But yet, no spiders. A scream fills the hut. The bed rocks violently. The doctor looks down in horror to see the dead man is not as dead as he'd appeared. He thrashes this way and that, straining against the ties on his limbs. The doctor calls out for the translator, who appears at his side almost immediately. The translator shouts something in Mandarin, trying to be heard over the dying man's screams, but it's no use. The man throws his head this way and that, trying to bash his chin into his own chest or hit the top of his skull against the nearest wall. It is no use. The man opens cloudy eyes that stare wildly around the room, searching for something, anything that could help him break free from his restraints. Without thinking, the doctor grabs the man's head and holds it steady. He peers into the man's weeping eyes. Bizarre. If he didn't know better, he'd say they almost looked as if they had spider's webs built up beneath the eyelids, clouding out the man's windows to see the world. Small, silvery balls of thick liquid gather in the corners of them, too dense, too murky to be tears. From somewhere beneath the haze, the man's pupils find the doctor's. In an instant, his body falls still. It is almost as if he relaxed completely. A guttural murmur comes from the man's throat. The doctor looks to the translator for help. Free me. The doctor looks down at his patient. This is the part of medicine he had always hated the most. At what point do you let someone go? At what point do you say it's too late? Is it even right for him to make that decision? Looking at the man lying in front of him, a wave of sadness washes over him. His initial assessment had been right. It is too late. Even if he could treat the gangrene in the man's limbs with amputation, there's still starvation and dehydration to deal with. And then, the apparent venom from the spiders. Except, there are no signs of venom. Perhaps it isn't too late after all. With the right treatment, there may be a chance to… The man's wrist snaps, becoming a loose glove of broken bone that's easily pulled from the restraint. A foul stench of exposed rotten flesh hits the doctor like a slap in the face. He reels back in horror as the man pulls his other decimated hand free too. Unbound by his bed, the man lets out an animalistic roar. Sitting up in the bed, he tips his head back and starts pounding at it with what is left of his hands. Jagged wrist bones, barely housed by paper-thin skin, slam repeatedly into his forehead, harder and harder with each hit. The doctor is frozen to the spot, staring as the man smashes his own head. Skin splits, revealing white bone. Bone cracks. Then, with one last effort that seems to take every remaining morsel of the man's energy, he turns and crunches his fractured skull against the wall, caving the front half of his head in like a deflated basketball. Silence, more terrifying than any sound, fills the hut. The doctor stares at the body. An almost comical image pops into his head. The head looks like just a red plastic bag that someone had left on the floor, full of shards of broken pottery. He almost smiles. But then, the spiders appear. Just one at first, then ten, then a stream, then an eruption, spewing out of the gaps in the man's head like water shooting out of a collapsing dam. The tiny pink spiders flood the room, shooting up the walls into every crack and crevice, writhing and rippling around their feet. That breaks the doctor's paralysis. He and the translator sprint for the door. They crash through it and cover the length of the village in seconds. Grabbing the door handles, they haul themselves up into the 4x4. Four four. The translator slams it into reverse and almost crashes into a tree as he turns them around and back onto the dirt trail. They drive all through the night, not talking. The doctor gets control of his breathing, but his heart does not stop hammering the whole time. He cannot shake the images that fill his head. Spiders. Tiny pink spiders. Everywhere. The sun is just rising when the driver suddenly pulls over sharply. 
His eyes are wide, his face deathly pale. He doesn't say a word as he sits forward, reaches down the back of his shirt, and pulls out one tiny pink spider. The doctor yells in shock and hurriedly grabs a sample pot for the man to throw the spider into. The two men sit there in the front of the car in the warm morning light, staring through the glass at the arachnid. It looks soft. That's the most bizarre thing about it. Rather than having a hard, dark exoskeleton like other spiders, this one looks fleshy. No, that's not quite right. It looks fatty. It looks squishy like parts of the body that get exposed in traumatic crashes. Wrinkles and folds of pink, mushy cells with fatty deposits. Except it cannot be made from those kinds of things. It's a spider. As they watch, the spider seems to recognize their attention. It stands up on its back four legs and raises the remaining ones in the air. It looks almost as if it is doing some kind of mating dance for them. It turns its back to them, revealing a pattern of brightly colored dots across its abdomen. The doctor drags his eyes away from the dance. The sun is gone. Night has fallen again. His stomach stabs at him in hunger. But that can't be right. It was sunrise only a few seconds ago. The headache had started as he sat down on his flight. Now, five hours in and somewhere over an ocean, he knows he is not going to sleep tonight. He can't get the image of all those spiders out of his mind. He needs to report this. And he will, definitely. But not yet. A spider crawls up the seat in front of him. His heart stops, and he sits back violently in his seat, eyes wide. On the floor of the plane, pink spiders everywhere. They're not real. They're not real, just his imagination. He needs some rest. That's what he needs. He'll fly home, wait for the headache to pass. Then he can call someone. But right now, he just feels too groggy to do any of that. The adrenaline of his hallucination passes as quickly as it had come. He can feel the glass pot in his pocket tapping occasionally, begging for his attention. His head aches. He runs a hand through his hair. That can't be. Is he really growing gray hairs already? In frustration, he reaches up and taps at his forehead. Much to his surprise, the headache disappears almost instantaneously. If anything, it feels… good? He sits there for several minutes, drumming a couple of fingers against his forehead, and before he knows it, he's fast asleep, all his fears and anxieties long behind him. Only they are not behind him. Once he touches down, he goes straight home to his apartment. No spiders to be seen. Why not? Shouldn't there be more spiders? He certainly wants more spiders. His headache comes back. He drinks water, takes some medicine, goes for a nap, and turns off all of the lights. But nothing seems to work. Even the tapping stops working more spiders. A call lights up his phone screen, an international number. He takes a long time to answer it. It's his translator. The man's voice is shrill, panicked, far beyond what the doctor had ever heard before, even when they'd been running from the spiders. The translator is not making much sense. His words are slurred, and his sentences stop and start seemingly at random. None of it makes sense. The doctor turns the volume on his phone down. It's too loud for his headache, way too loud. Government knows. Should have worn gloves. Too late. The pain. The pleasure. Using a hammer. Huh? None of it makes any sense. The doctor looks down at his phone screen. The call is gone. His phone is dead. Hadn't it been on full a moment ago? What time is it? And where are the spiders? He punches himself in the head. A smile spreads across his face. He's in bed now. Something red around him. His pillow. It is soaked red. Could that be from his head? The sample pot sits on his bedside table. Only now... It's empty. How did that happen? Wasn't he standing in the kitchen a moment ago? He's losing time. He runs a hand through his hair. Webbing clings between his fingers. He sits under his desk with a hammer in his hand, euphoria washing over his body. Just once more. Eight more times. He hits the hammer against his forehead. Endorphins flood every cell of his body, so powerful he almost passes out as the pleasure chemicals crawl inside of him, oozing silk through the pores of his skin. Webs hang all over his apartment now. Just one more hit. Eight more hits. That feeling, it's just so. His wrists, his ankles. How many limbs? Four. Not enough. That light. Where is he? Figures crowd around him. It is hard to see them. Something's in his eye. Everything looks blurry and far away. The pain. The pain is back. His head. Someone, please. He screams and pulls against the bindings on his limbs. The pain. It's... It's impossible. He needs to make it stop. Just one hit. Just one more hit from the hammer. That'll be enough. Something is behind his eye. He can feel it. Something crawling on the back of his eyeball. 
but that doesn't matter. None of it matters, except getting his pain to stop. No more headaches, just one more hit. That's all he needs. The hospital staff have never seen anything like this before. They're out of their depth here. In the dead of night, they arrange for the doctor to be transferred to a specialist facility in the back of an ambulance. It is a challenge to get him out of his bed, as the spider's web secreting from his skin have all but tied him to the linen. As fate would have it, a drunk driver gives the doctor his final wish. Not seeing a red light, the driver plows full speed into the side of the ambulance, sending it spinning off the road and down a hill, killing everyone inside, including the doctor. When police arrive at the scene in the early hours of the morning, they find the driver sitting on his own, staring at some small insect by the wreckage. The driver is unharmed by the incident. His only complaint as he spends the following night in police custody is that he feels a mild headache coming on. Anyone experiencing that headache is likely already too far gone from their exposure to SCP-632, an anomalous species of cognitohazardous arachnids nicknamed intrusive arachnid thoughts. Unconfirmed reports of mysterious spider colonies have been springing up across Asia, particularly in rural China, for several decades in connection with this anomaly. In 1972, the population of an unnamed town in the Anhui province were found to have been almost entirely wiped out. An entire town of corpses, each with their heads caved in, brain matter missing. With 106 dead, with 23 injured, this case is to this day the deadliest confirmed SCP-632 breach. Strange as it may be, physiologically speaking, SCP-632 could be considered cute. Their bodies are squishy in texture, bright pink, and are in fact made up of human tissue, brain tissue to be exact, coated in a layer of protective fat. As happened to our unfortunate doctor, SCP-632 reproduces parasitically within the human skull. The exact mechanics of this process remain unclear. It is believed that SCP-632 infects its human host through a selection of sensory triggers. Those infected have each testified to having been exposed to the following. Firstly, viewing the pattern on SCP-632's abdomen exposed during the dance that the spiders often do under observation. Secondly, making physical contact with SCP-632. And lastly, through exposure to as yet unidentified chemical compounds secreted by the older SCP-632 instances. This is where Luck was not on our doctor's side. He was smart enough to wear gloves during his encounter with SCP-632 in China, which may have been enough to protect him from being infected. However, upon his arrival as he fell out of the car, his hand landed directly in an SCP-632 web, housing a solitary live spider. If he had remembered his car sickness tablets, this could have all been avoided. Within three hours of initial exposure to SCP-632, the subject will start to experience mild headaches, followed by an uncanny sensation that their skin is growing silk. During this period, MRI scans have found that small filament-like structures start to form within the host's brain tissue. As these filaments multiply and spread throughout the brain, the subjects report developing an obsession with spiders. The brain tissue steadily deteriorates, leading to changes in personality and mood, as well as irrational behavior. Over the coming days, the headaches grow more severe as the filament cells press against the blood vessels lining the inside of the skull. Subjects find that they can relieve this sensation by tapping or hitting their forehead, replacing it with a pleasurable feeling as the filaments release endorphins upon impact. This is part of the sinister final act of SCP-632's reproduction. After six to seven days, as the host's headaches worsen, they find they have to hit their skull harder and harder to alleviate the pain and get that chemical high. Eventually, driven mad by the pain inside their head, they crack through their own skull. At this point, all of the gestating spiders that have been forming within the filaments in their brain, estimated to number between 80 and 200, can escape through the opening. Because of its unique containment difficulties caused by its cognitohazardous properties, SCP-632 has been given the Euclid object class. There is currently one live colony of SCP-632 stored in the biological containment wing of Site-52. The colony is housed in a small enclosure measured 20 centimeters by 40 centimeters by 20 centimeters and sustained on a diet of insects and water supplied through a vacuum chute. All personnel that work in proximity to SCP-632 are regularly screened. Physical contact with any SCP-632 is strictly prohibited, and all personnel are required to wear protective equipment and respirators at all times while handling live or deceased specimens. They keep a close eye on anyone developing any symptoms, especially headaches, the feeling of silk on the skin, or intrusive arachnid thoughts. A businessman from Queens had been saving for years to get something he'd been dreaming of since childhood, a particular wristwatch which cost just over $20,000. However, 
Mere days after getting his hands on the pricey accessory, he noticed a small defect on the edge of the watch case. It was a small metal nub, an imperfection that he could have sworn wasn't there when he first bought it. After all, he paid 20 grand for the thing. Surely he'd notice if something was wrong with it when he first picked it up. He brought the watch to the official service center out on 5th Avenue that Friday evening. They'd check the watch out and have it back to him by Monday, good as new. You don't buy a watch like this if you expect anything less than the very best. The businessman's watch was stored in a secure vault with several hundred others as it awaited repair from a highly trained technician. What happened next would be considered unbelievable if it hadn't all been caught on the security camera. The first watch began to mutate over the next 18 hours. It shattered into a twisted mass of glass and metal cogs, its hands shooting out in every direction as four legs and a metal eye grew out of the resulting mass. This spider-like creature then skittered across every single other watch in the storage vault, and within another 18 hours, they mutated too, until the room was positively alive with tiny metal creatures. Meanwhile, over at Site 19, a guard began to notice that his standard-issue Foundation handgun was unusually uncomfortable to hold. Perhaps he was developing a nerve issue or carpal tunnel syndrome. It's not that uncommon in the profession. But no, it was actually the strange metal nub forming on his pistol's grip. He had no idea that, inside the gun, a bizarre transformation was beginning to take place. And within three days of the nub first appearing on the handgun, it underwent a remarkable metamorphosis. Much like the watches, the gun mutated, growing four legs and an eye, and began running through Site-19, causing chaos. The gun began firing with reckless abandon, sending bullets ricocheting off the walls and injuring Dr. Jack Bright and Dr. Sophia Light as they attempted to disable the rogue pistol. It was able to fire in a sustained fashion for over a solid minute before stopping to synthesize new bullets through unknown means. Eventually, the weapon was captured and subsequently destroyed for presenting an active danger to SCP Foundation personnel. Meanwhile, in an insurance provider's office building out in South Dakota, one of the many desk drones working their fingers to the bone typing up insurance claims barely noticed a small plastic nub forming on the side of their wireless keyboard. It remained this way for a relatively uneventful six days, before finally undergoing a complete transformation. It became a chaotic configuration of legs and keys, spelling out the words, Ask, We Will Answer, on the top of its body. It wandered around the office, seemingly brushing up against as many other pieces of technology as it could. The astonished workers found that if you typed any complete sentence onto this mechanical creature's keys, it would be rendered inactive for around an hour, much to the relief of everyone who was there at the time. In New Mexico, a small child was about to be scarred for life when his brand new talking action figure developed a plastic nub on the nape of its neck. The child didn't really pay any mind to it. However, within 10 days of the nub's appearance, the toy took on a transformation that was impossible to ignore. The toy burst open, its head growing four legs and skittering away from its own broken body. When the little boy saw this, he called for his mother. When it began skittering towards him at surprising speed, he screamed and fled. The head, which had also somehow lost its eyes to an even more frightening effect, kept repeating, Mom, there's something wrong with my toy! In the little boy's voice, if it wasn't for the Foundation amnestics that he and his mother would later receive, he likely would have been scarred for life by the anomalous experience. In Idaho, an old woman who lived alone noticed something strange going on with her television set. A lump of warped, bulbous plastic had started forming on the top. She decided to call a TV repairman, or perhaps her son, who didn't call her nearly enough, to come over and take a look at it. But as things often do in life, she let it slip her mind, and two weeks passed without her addressing it. This would prove to be a mistake. Not that any TV repairman really could have done anything to help. The TV sprouted four long, spider-like legs and a single eye. The screen perpetually showed shaky footage of an unmoving figure suspended mid-air in the middle of a blank, featureless room. This change from the usual programming disturbed the old woman greatly, even more so as the television began advancing towards her. Meanwhile, soldiers operating a tank stationed in Syria noticed a small metal welt on its chassis. Of course, given the natural wear and tear experienced by tanks on an active battlefield, None of them paid much mind to such a tiny defect. It continued like this for a month and a half, until tragedy finally struck in the most unexpected fashion. Much like the handgun over in Site-19, 
the tank grew legs and started firing in every direction, devastating nearby infrastructure and killing scores of people around it. It seemed not to discriminate or even really to aim. It fired in all directions with soldiers and civilians alike, and it took several groups of soldiers armed with anti-tank weaponry to finally put it down. No explanation was ever given for what happened that day. Most people just assumed that it was a tank operator who'd snapped under the intense pressures of war and gun berserk, but the truth would forever elude them. So what is the truth? Why has all this machinery, from innocent to disastrous, been taking on a mind of its own and causing chaos across the globe? Allow me to explain. These are just a few entries from the filing cabinet of incident reports belonging to SCP-658, a parasitic mechanical entity that's also known as the botflies. SCP-658 instances are a unique species of highly reproductive anomalous creatures characterized by their four long, thin legs on the underside of their bodies and their single large mechanical eye somewhere on the upper body. They reproduce through contact with any man-made mechanical objects, though the exact means of parasitic infection are unclear. Simply making contact seems to be enough to turn an object into a breeding pod for a growing SCP-658 embryo and gestation time is dependent on the size and complexity of the infected object. The embryo will present itself as a metal or plastic nub on the surface of the object, appearing to the untrained eye like some kind of minor production defect. This keeps the embryo safe as it develops, growing and absorbing the surrounding technology into its own biomechanical makeup. Incidentally, the name botfly is a play on an equally unpleasant, non-anomalous parasitic insect, Latin name ostridae, which implant their eggs into the living flesh of their victims, where they incubate, grow, and eventually burst out from the skin. The similarities in breeding patterns of non-anomalous botflies and SCP-658 are self-evident. These entities vary massively in size, from the diminutive stature of 5 mm squared to hundreds of meters. The size of an SCP-658 instance, much like its aforementioned gestation period, depends entirely on its host object. And Foundation research has indicated that any complex man-made mechanical object is susceptible to parasitic infection. From cell phones to jumbo jets, all technology is on the table for 658. And as indicated through the eyewitness accounts in the case files, the appearance of the individual SCP-658 instances are reflective of whatever technology incubated them. This influence of the host technology also appears to extend to SCP-658 behavior, with more benign objects like phones or wristwatches becoming equally benign creatures, and weapons such as firearms or combat-ready vehicles taking on a more aggressive nature. Given that the US military alone has thousands of vehicles and even more firearms, there are naturally some concerns about what would happen if ever an SCP-658 outbreak got out of control at a military base. Thanks to the extreme proliferation of and dependence on technology in our modern era, a large-scale containment breach of SCP-658 could lead to a catastrophic exponential population boom. The SCP Foundation is keeping an extremely close eye on any signs of SCP-658 activity, especially in technologically advanced cities and other densely populated locations. Research has proven that these creatures are capable of manifesting adaptations that increase their reproductive ability even further. For example, during one test, it was proven that one SCP-658 instance was capable of impregnating another. The result was it transforming into a creature with eight legs and two eyes that was capable of impregnating any objects they touched with two embryos, rather than the typical single embryo. While senior researchers deemed it unwise to see exactly how far these 658 interbreeding experiments could go, it stands to reason that it could also be subjected to an exponential increase. One hypermutated 658 instance could be capable of mass impregnating larger pieces of technology with hundreds if not thousands of embryos. You can see how these often tiny and seemingly harmless creatures could quickly become a big problem for all of us. Picture every vehicle, cars, trucks, motorcycles, scooters, ATVs, vans, Humvees, tanks, planes, helicopters, speedboats, yachts, cruise ships, battleships all becoming hypermutated SCP-658 instances. Then add every phone, every laptop, every computer, every tablet, every TV, every printer, every kitchen appliance, every gun, all being infected with SCP-658 embryos and joining the horde. 
Given how much all of us, including the SCP Foundation, rely on this technology and so much more in our work and daily lives, it's clear how the uncontrolled proliferation of SCP-658 would completely alter the world as we know it. It's a clear reminder of the importance of the SCP Foundation's work. The worst case scenarios for even some of the more innocent seeming SCPs can be startlingly bleak. Due to the mechanical nature of these anomalies, all connections to the Church of the Broken God and their illicit activities are being explored by Foundation field personnel. Containment protocols on SCP-658 are extremely clear. Any instance of SCP-658 no larger than 50 centimeters across any axis, considered to be a small SCP-658 sample, is to be stored alone in a steel box when not being used in active testing. Special containment procedures specify that the box must be kept closed through low-tech means, and we mean a true return to basics here. String or duct tape are the preferred methods of keeping them under lock and key, or, as some researchers prefer, weighing down the lid with heavy books. Anything with a more complex locking mechanism is capable of being impregnated by SCP-658, completely negating containment. Any 658 samples larger than 50 centimeters are to be destroyed as soon as possible after being apprehended by Foundation personnel. This destroy on site order is also applicable for any technology infected by SCP-658 outside of intentional testing scenarios. In order to avoid population growth during containment, all captured SCP-658 samples must be kept at least 3 meters away from any man-made technology capable of sustaining an SCP-658 embryo. If unsure of whether an object is applicable, researchers and guards are told to err on the side of caution when it comes to this anomaly, which has been classified as Euclid. After all, when it comes to SCP-658, or really, any SCPs, it's far better to be safe than sorry. Two men walk through a hot, dusty tunnel carved right into the rock. Their torches cast just enough light to see that the walls are covered with strange hieroglyphics. They've been in many tombs before, but they've never seen markings like these before. They spot something up ahead, a person slumped against the wall. One of the men rushes over and sees that whoever this was, they've been here a very long time. Nothing is left but bones and a few scraps of cloth. As the man examines the skeleton, his partner calls him over. There's something he has to see. He's looking through a hole in the tunnel wall, and on the other side is an enormous cavern. In the middle of the giant room is the strangest sight either man has ever seen. An enormous upside-down pyramid that stretches down from the roof of the cave. They look at each other in amazement before running down deeper into the tunnel, sure that it will lead them to the pyramid and the incredible treasures it must have inside. They can see through more holes in the tunnel wall that they are getting closer and closer to the pyramid. Finally, they reach an entrance into the uppermost and widest part of the structure. As they enter the upside-down pyramid, they see that the passages are at least twice as high as any they've ever seen, and are covered with more of the strange markings. They start walking through the passageway, and soon realize that there are numerous twists, turns, branching paths, and dead ends. It's a maze. The man turns to tell his friend that they should consider leaving and coming back with others, but he finds that he's all alone. They must have gotten separated at some point. He starts backtracking through the passages, turning this way and that, trying to retrace his steps. He abruptly stops, though, when he hears a strange noise. A metallic grinding sound fills the air. The man watches as the walls themselves start to move, shifting and rearranging themselves. Without warning, the open passage in front of him closes, sealing his path back. The man begins to scream. There's no answer to his cries. Panicked, he runs deeper and deeper into the maze, but try as he might, he can't find his friend or the exit. How long has he been walking? Hours? Days? He can remember hearing the walls shift at least one other time. Exhausted, he sits down against the wall. He'll just take a little rest, then it's back to work. He must be able to find his way out. He must escape. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-875 also known as War Criminals. SCP-875 is the designation the SCP Foundation has given to a massive underground pyramid whose exact location is a closely guarded secret. As of yet, no record of the pyramid's construction has been found in any historical documents, though there is evidence that suggests SCP-875 is a man-made structure. While the outside of SCP-875 is made of normal sandstone like the pyramids of Egypt, 
there is an inner layer composed of a metal alloy that has yet to be identified. The first floor of SCP-875 is accessible through a tunnel and contains a number of passageways that appear to have been built for entities much taller than humans. These passages are arranged into a maze-like configuration, complete with double backs and dead ends. Adding to the confusion is that the geography of the maze periodically changes. Mechanisms located within the walls and floor activate automatically every 48 hours, completely changing the layout. While anyone unlucky enough to be trapped within the shifting walls of SCP-875 may find themselves unable to leave by the path they entered, there are a number of hidden pressure plates and levers that can be found throughout the labyrinth that open up sections of the wall, creating new paths and shortcuts. But these switches also cause the release of what the Foundation has designated SCP-875-1. SCP-875-1 are small, flying insect-like creatures, approximately 6 centimeters long, with a mass of roughly 3 grams. They bear no resemblance to any known species of insect on Earth, suggesting that their origin may be extraterrestrial. When released, SCP-875-1s will swarm the nearest person, stinging them mercilessly. Their sting is highly acidic and causes severe damage to nerves and tendons, and this potent acid combined with their tendency to swarm, has resulted in victims' limbs becoming what can only be described as liquefied. Previous uses of explosives within the pyramid have left openings to a lower second floor that are relatively easy to access, provided that the maze's current configuration allows the breaches to be reached. The main feature of the second floor is four large vats, each of which contains a clear liquid similar in appearance to normal water that has been designated SCP-8752. When humans are exposed to SCP-8752, they experience effects similar to an amnestic, but with the added sensation of feeling both happy and satisfied. Following what look like maintenance tunnels on the second floor leads down to a third floor of the pyramid that is home to a large nuclear reactor. The reactor takes up most of the area of this level of the pyramid and appears to be self-cooling with no evidence of a meltdown or other nuclear disaster having taken place. This reactor seems to be powering the rest of the pyramid, including the maze reorganizing mechanisms on the first floor, as well as what's hidden on the mysterious lowest level of SCP-875. Although there is no direct access to the fourth floor of the pyramid, tunneling through the floor of the third level has revealed something incredible. Inside a small room are what look to be ten separate cryogenic stasis chambers. The chambers are arranged in a circular formation, and strangest of all, they're all occupied. Inside each pod is a large, insectoid creature roughly 3 meters tall and weighing 240 kilograms that have been designated SCP-8753. Three of the creatures appear to have died from their stasis chambers failing at some point in the past, and heavy decomposition has set in. Several other of the insectoid creatures are heavily damaged, though it is unknown if this is due to issues with the pods or if they had sustained injuries prior to entering stasis. While it is not known what exactly these creatures are, where they came from, or if their origin is even terrestrial, examination and analysis of some of the images carved into the walls of SCP-875's first floor have provided interesting information. In one, two figures that bear a resemblance to SCP-8753 are depicted facing each other, with one appearing to be stabbing the other with a spear, implying some kind of violent conflict in the past. In the next, Another figure that looks like SCP-8753 is shown presenting a stone slab to what looks to be a human dressed in the garb of ancient Egypt. The Egyptian is facing away from the insectoid, which might suggest a breakdown in communication or an unwillingness of the Egyptian to listen to the insectoid. The third image, though, shows two humanoid figures now bowing to the insectoid figure, next to an image of a chalice with a drop of liquid falling into it. This may represent SCP-8752, the amnestic liquid, and the way its effects were used to subdue this group of people. This hypothesis is further strengthened by a fourth image that shows an insectoid figure watching two humanoids pulling what looks like a large stone block with ropes. A fifth image shows the insectoid figure standing next to what looks like a dead humanoid, consuming a part of it. And finally, a sixth image depicts the insectoid inside of a small rectangle that may represent the stasis chambers found on the lowest level of the pyramid. Are these entities sleeping inside the stasis chambers the same ones depicted on the walls of the pyramid? 
Did they arrive on Earth and subjugate a group of humans, forcing them to build a monument that could contain their stasis chambers and keep them in a form of perennial living death? Perhaps this question has been answered by a mysterious transmission that was detected by the Foundation. Coming from an unknown source, the transmission was in English, but the grammar and word choice sounded like it was from someone who had only the most basic understanding of the language. The transmission, in no uncertain terms, demanded the return of the war criminals, and that if they were not returned, that 95% of the species would be made extinct. It then went on to describe a number of offenses perpetrated by these war criminals, including claims of massacres and cannibalism. Were the creatures in the bottom of SCP-875 convicts on the run, war criminals from another planet or even another reality, who had fled to Earth to escape justice? It may never be known for sure, as the message degraded and became unintelligible before it could finish. Due to its stable location and the relative ease with which the public can be kept away from it, SCP-875 has been classified as safe. Its location is marked as a military base on maps, with satellite images altered according to Procedure Watson 24. Civilians who approach the area are to be taken into Foundation custody and administered Class A amnestics. Research personnel are only allowed inside SCP-875 when accompanied by two security staff, and six maintenance personnel are to monitor the nuclear reactor at all times. If any staff are stung by instances of SCP-875-1, they are to be treated on-site by medical personnel with alkali to neutralize the acidic stings. And in extreme cases, amputation of the affected limbs is authorized. In the event that an SCP-875-3 specimen becomes active, security personnel are to subdue them in a non-fatal manner if possible and transport them to a secure site for further research. At first glance, it looks like a perfectly ordinary bathroom. Nothing to suggest that anything weird is going on here. Certainly, if the D-Class personnel assigned to investigate this facility had encountered this room in the wild, if you walked into a bathroom that looked like this while visiting a friend's house or lunching in a restaurant or even stopping at a gas station rest stop, he wouldn't have any reason to think anything was amiss. But this is the SCP Foundation, so he knows that nothing here is as it seems. He glances briefly up at the camera installed in the ceiling. The lens aperture dilates briefly, focusing on his face, and he knows that an SCP technical on the other end is watching his every move. He grimaces, fully aware that his status as a member of D-Class personnel means that every experiment could be his last. That knowledge doesn't exactly endear him to the Foundation or its mission, but it's not like he has much of a choice in picking his assignments. Suddenly, a voice crackles to life over the intercom. Please step fully into the bathroom, says the researcher on the other end of the camera feed. What's this all about? asks the D-Class personnel. This is just a bathroom, isn't it? What's so special about this place? His eyes scan the room. The floor is covered with smooth white tiles. The walls are a soothing light blue color, reminiscent of a calm ocean, the sort of color that you might pick for its soothing effect when you need to make use of these facilities. A large mirror is fixed to the wall before a countertop with a sink. Next to the sink, there's a toilet, and next to that, a bathtub with a shower. There's a scrubbing brush and a plunger stashed behind the toilet tank, and a fuzzy shag cover stretched over the toilet lid. It's all very ordinary. It's much too ordinary, he thinks. A sudden horrible thought occurs to him. You're not going to watch me use the toilet, he asks, a slight edge of panic in his voice. That's absurd, of course, but here at the SCP Foundation, there's nothing that he would put past these people. They've always got some new weirdness happening, and it wouldn't at all surprise him to learn that they would want to watch him at his most exposed. The voice comes back over the intercom. What? No, you don't need to use that. Look, just step forward. Literally all that I want you to do is to step into the room. The D-Class smirks to himself. He's already been through more of these crazy experiments than he would care to remember, and he has the scars to prove it. It gives him a small measure of satisfaction to hear the agent getting flustered. Even if he has to participate in these dangerous experiments, he can at least make things awkward for his tormentors. That seems like a little bit of poetic justice to him. As the agent requested, though, he steps forward. The moment that he's cleared the threshold, the door slams behind him with a crash. The D-Class jumps in surprise and shouts, What the? Why'd you do that? I didn't do that, says the voice over the intercom. Of course, thinks the D-Class personnel. He should have expected this. He grabs the doorknob and tries to yank the door open, but the door is stuck fast. He yanks again, harder this time, but the result is the same. The door doesn't budge at all. The door's stuck! cries the D-Class. He feels his heart start to beat faster, and his temperature begins to rise. 
What terrible thing does this room plan to do to him? But after a moment, he begins to calm down. It doesn't seem like this room is planning to do anything. Maybe it's just a room with a weird door. But if that were the case, then why would the SCP Foundation be interested in this? Just hang tight, says the agent. I'll see what I can do about getting that door open. A few moments later, the agent arrives at the door to the bathroom and gives it a sharp yank. It doesn't budge. Door's stuck, she says. The D-Class rolls his eyes. Of course it's stuck. Hold on a second, I'll go get a technician, she says. The D-Class personnel listens to the sound of the agent's feet retreating into the distance. He sits down on the closed toilet and buries his face in his hands. What a day. Is he going to be trapped inside this bathroom forever? He can't help but speculate, but he tries not to think about it. He's more annoyed than anything, truth be told. He wonders if the agent is actually going for help or if she's still just sitting in her cubicle, watching him through the camera and waiting for the other shoe to drop. His eyes flick to the camera and he furrows his brow. He's so intent on the camera that he doesn't notice as a dark shape slowly bubbles out from the bathtub drain. It's a cockroach, a perfectly ordinary cockroach. Or is it? The roach remains motionless for a moment, perfectly still, except for the subtle twitch of its antenna. Then, all at once, it starts to move. The roach scuttles across the tub, scaling the porcelain walls, and runs across the counter. Like all cockroaches, it seems confused now that it's emerged into the light and eager to find a dark corner where it can hide again. It reaches the edge of the countertop, but, of course, a sheer cliff is no obstacle for an insect. It shimmies down the cabinet and makes a dash across the tiled floor. That's when the moving roach finally catches the eye of the D-Class personnel. He yelps in surprise and pulls his feet up, his knees going flush with his chest. The roach looks oddly out of place in this clean and well-maintained bathroom, and the sight of this disgusting little vermin fills the D-Class with a sudden and deep sense of loathing. That's one massive cockroach, he mumbles to himself. Almost as if it heard his words, the roach starts to skitter toward him. The D-Class does not like that at all. Without hesitation, he immediately stomps on the roach, bringing his foot down with a definite thud and then grinding the unfortunate insect under his heel. The sound is loud enough to attract the attention of the agent behind the camera. Apparently, she must have returned to her post after sending a request for a technician. What was that? She asks, her voice crackling over the intercom. There was a really huge cockroach, just came out of the tub. Come on, hurry up and get the door open. I don't like it in here. There might be more of them. Okay, okay, says the agent. Just hold on for a second. Help will be here in just a couple minutes. Don't be so jumpy, it's just a bug after all, nothing to worry about. The D-Class personnel isn't so sure of that. After all, when you're dealing with unknown anomalies like those in the SCP archives, can you ever just not worry? He pulls his shoe off, stands up from the toilet, and walks over to the sink. Grumbling to himself, he turns the faucet and starts to wash the insect icor off the bottom of his shoe. He's too intent on his activity to notice that a second cockroach has already popped out of the bathtub drain. Like the first one, it hesitates for a moment, and then it scuttles across the tub, scales the walls, and makes a beeline for its deceased comrade. As this happens, a third roach emerges from the drain, and a fourth. By the time the D-Class turns around, a whole battalion of cockroaches has entered the bathroom. His eyes go wide as he takes in the scene. A good dozen roaches have clustered around the first smashed roach, all feeding on its carcass. It's a grisly scene, and the D-Class is immediately revolted. He knows nothing about roaches, nothing that might suggest to him that this is in any way unusual behavior for these insects, but he doesn't really care. It looks disgusting, and he's positive that it isn't natural. I don't like this, I don't like this, he yells, panic rising in his voice. Get me out of here! Hurry up and open the stupid door! The observing agent, safe in her office, doesn't share the D-Class personnel's terror. From her point of view, she's just watching a man freak out over a couple of perfectly ordinary bugs. Of course, the scene takes on a whole different feel when you're not the one being asked to expose yourself to strange and potentially dangerous SCPs. She can't help but chuckle at the scene. It's not funny, cries the D-Class, once again jumping on the toilet and pulling up his legs into a fetal position. Those things are huge! You better get me out of here now, or… 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 He struggles to think of some threat that might convince the agent to take him seriously, but he fails. The agent is too busy taking notes on the situation. The roaches look to be ordinary specimens of the American cockroach, each about five or six centimeters long. When the group of roaches has devoured their smashed comrade, that's when things start to get really strange. The small group turns as one toward the D-Class. Now that is weird, thinks the agent. The D-Class probably thinks the same, because he starts to scream incoherently. Both agent and D-Class are so focused on the roaches that they don't notice something even more sinister happening in the bathtub. 
A dark, tar-like substance has started to seep out of the drain, gradually filling the bathtub. The agent is too busy trying to soothe the D-Class, trying to convince him to stop screaming and start explaining the scene to her in rational detail so that she can add his observations to her notes. Meanwhile, the oily black tar continues to bubble from the drain, the surface level rising, until the tub is approximately one-fifth full of black goo. The D-Class's eyes suddenly alight on the tub. What the… What, what's this? He mutters. Suddenly, dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds, of roaches start to rise from the black goo. They boil over the sides of the tub in massive chitinous waves, spreading across the floor of the bathroom in a solid sheet of glimmering black carapaces. It happens so fast that the D-Class can only gibber in mindless terror. There are too many roaches. For the moment, the D-Class seems safe perched on the toilet. The roaches can't scale up the shiny porcelain, slipping back down at every attempt. He scrambles to his feet, standing on top of the toilet lid and praying that it will hold his full weight. Otherwise, he's going to tumble head first into that writhing, seething swarm of vermin. He stares at what looks like an ocean of living insects, the light reflecting off their chitinous shells with an evil oily gleam. It's like a scene out of a cheesy horror movie, but it's all too real. Through his panic, the D-Class vaguely recalls that when he was a kid, he once read a book about ancient life on Earth during the Permian era, when the Earth was a hot, humid jungle, when high temperatures and oxygen-rich air made the world perfect for giant insects. Cockroaches have lived on this Earth for how many million years, he wonders. He knows it's a lot, and he can't help but think about that legacy now that he's confronted with a living carpet made entirely out of roaches. Aren't scientists always predicting that cockroaches will eventually outlive humanity? They're the only nasty little things tenacious enough to survive a nuclear holocaust or the punishments of climate change. He's less worried that cockroaches will outlive humanity right now, though, and more worried that they might outlive him personally. The roaches can't get up the toilet, but they have more success in scaling the walls. Soon the walls are covered in a mass of roaches, the air filling with a constant cacophony of chittering and scratching that sends chills up the spine of the panicking D-Class. The roaches start to march across the ceiling, and the D-Class gets the distinct impression that, if he doesn't do something fast, he's going to be completely covered. In desperation, he throws his shoe across the room with all his might, shouting curses as he does, but it doesn't do any good. His shoe hits the opposite wall and bounces off, dropping into the swarm and quickly sinking beneath the rolling tide of chittering insects. His futile attack only provokes the insect mob, and several dozen roaches take flight, launching themselves at the D-Class. He shouts and claws them away as roaches land on his face and shoulders. They scramble up his neck and tangle themselves in his hair. He keeps shouting and swatting them away, but there are more and more of them every second. More roaches are swarming out from the black oil simmering in the bathtub every second, and now they all seem intent on the D-Class. They crawl inside his mouth as he screams. He gags and coughs, trying to spit them out, but it seems that they're already crawling down his throat. In his panic, he slips and lurches forward, screaming and flailing his arms helplessly. He dives into the writhing mass of roaches. Within seconds, he is covered in a sheet of living insects. The observing agent is speechless, unable to comprehend the sheer insanity of what she is seeing. But watching the D-Class be consumed by cockroaches prompts her to vomit in disgust. The retching, gagging noises can be heard over the intercom, hardly professional behavior, but we're way past worrying about that by now. By now, the bathtub is almost completely filled with black goo. The roaches start to return to the bathtub, scaling the tub walls in vast waves and throwing themselves into the pool of dark tar. As they retreat, they reveal the decimated remains of the D-Class. The corpse is ragged and bloody, partially eaten, its stomach visibly bloated. It twitches slightly, and the observing agent momentarily wonders if it's somehow possible that the D-Class personnel survived his ordeal, even though even a brief glance at the state of the corpse should make it clear it would be impossible. There's just far too much damage. It's obvious, in fact, that the twitching is caused by roaches that have burrowed into the body, squirming beneath its skin. Suddenly, something else begins to rise from the bathtub. It's another corpse, one in a much more advanced state of decomposition, to the point that it's nearly skeletal but there's still enough flesh clinging to its bones that you might be able to recognize it for the person it used to be. Under the black ooze, there's still a ghost of a face clinging to the skull, liquefying eyeballs still rolling around loosely in its dark sockets, tattered lips hanging off of stained teeth. Its eyes swivel toward the prone body of the D-Class with malevolent intention. Black tar drips from its arms and skull. It places one hand against the rim of the bathtub, the other against the blue wallpapered wall, and slowly hoists itself up and out of the pool of black tar, displacing another few dozen cockroaches with its movements. 
the corpse slowly stumbles to its feet, dribbling black ichor, and steps out of the bathtub. It staggers across the room with sticky, uncertain steps, leaving a trail of roaches and black goo. When it reaches the body of the D-Class, it grabs it by the leg and then drags it back across the bathroom floor toward the tub. The skeletal corpse pulls the body of the D-Class personnel into the tub, and both of them submerge into the black goo. The remaining cockroaches follow suit, jumping into the black oil and slowly sinking below the surface. At the same time, the level of the black substance begins to fall as it starts to swirl away down the drain. After several minutes, the black goo has completely drained away, leaving no trace that it ever existed. The roaches, the strange living cadaver, and the corpse of the D-Class have all completely vanished, so that by the time the door of the bathroom clicks open again, there's nothing to suggest that there's anything at all strange about this room. Too late, the agent bursts into the room, flinging open the now unlocked door with all her might. She scans the room in confusion, knowing that just moments ago, it was the scene of grisly carnage. There's no evidence of that now, but just the memory, the sight of the D-Class's bloated corpse, the sound of thousands of cockroaches marching and scuttling in unison, is enough to make the bile rise in her throat. She leans forward, hands on her knees, and vomits again. She's seen a lot as an SCP Foundation agent, but this SCP is definitely not one for the faint of heart, or the sick of stomach. What just happened here? Unfortunately, this is far from an unusual occurrence when you're dealing with SCP-6698. SCP-6698 is to all appearances a perfectly ordinary bathroom. Until it started to manifest anomalous behavior, it existed as a second-story bathroom in a private residence somewhere in Alabama in the United States. The first instance of anomalous behavior happened the day after a resident of the household, a 16-year-old male, reported killing an unusually large cockroach in the bathroom. The following night, when using the same bathroom, that same resident was overheard yelling in fright. His screams were followed by sounds described as a sink breaking and then a body falling against a crunchy and wet surface. Other members of the family attempted to respond to these sounds, but found that the door to the bathroom refused to open. Once the noises subsided, they found the door suddenly quite pliable, but when they checked inside, they could not find any evidence of the bathroom's teenage victim. The SCP Foundation quickly responded to the incident, amnesticizing the family and planting a suggestion that the missing teenager simply ran away from home into their subconscious. The family was moved from the residence, which was then purchased by a Foundation shell company to allow for further testing. When a human enters the room, the door to the bathroom immediately closes and locks. The door will remain locked until the event is completed. Attempts to physically damage the door when it is in its locked state have all met with failure. A recording camera was installed in the bathroom to allow agents to observe the event as it unfolds. Victims who unknowingly wander into SCP-6698 will find themselves trapped. Moments after the door locks, cockroaches will start to emerge from the drain of the bathtub. Once the swarm has reached sufficient mass, the roaches will attack and feed upon the victim. At the same time, a black oil will start to fill the tub, laying the stage for the emergence of the mysterious tar zombie, which then removes the corpse of the victim from the scene. The observing agent noted that the skeletal corpse she saw emerge from the tub bore a superficial resemblance to the missing 16-year-old male, raising questions about how SCP-6698 might have bonded with its original victim. Testing was suspended following the death of the D-Class personnel, so it is currently unclear if the same tar zombie appears during every instance, or if perhaps SCP-6698 pulls from a rotating roster of previous victims during its manifestations. At this moment, the relationship between the tar zombie, the black ooze, and the legions of carnivorous cockroaches is unclear, but large amounts of spectral energy have been detected in the room, leading to an assumption that the event must be supernatural in nature and to the involvement of the Department of Spectral Phenomena. Since SCP-6698 only attacks victims who enter the bathroom and does not appear to be capable of manifestation once the door is open, the SCP Foundation has attached a special apparatus to prevent the door from closing of its own accord, and assigned SCP-6698 a designation of safe. One thing that is for sure, though, is that of all the ways that deadly SCP anomalies might choose to do away with their victims, being eaten alive from the inside by a swarm of scuttling cockroaches probably ranks up there as one of the worst. So that's something to think about the next time that you're looking for a little privacy in the bathroom. A young man and his girlfriend enter the apartment they share. She tosses her keys on the entryway table as the man checks the time on his phone. He reminds the young woman that they will need to leave soon if they don't want to miss the movie they have purchased tickets for. The woman agrees, but she wants to take a quick shower before they leave. 
As she goes to freshen up, the man sits down at his computer to get in a quick round or two of his favorite online squad-based first-person shooter. He puts on his headset and jumps into a game. Before he knows it, he's just finished his third round. He checks the time on his phone again and realizes that they were running late. He takes off his headphones and is confused when he hears what sounds like the shower still running. He gets up and goes to the bathroom door and listens. The shower is definitely still on. The man knocks on the door and asks if everything is alright. He waits a moment, but there's no response. He knocks again, and still, nothing. She doesn't usually take showers this long, and he immediately worries that she might have passed out or… well, he doesn't even want to think about it. I'm coming in, okay? He announces as he opens the door to check on her. The man immediately notices how steamy the room is. The hot water must have been running for a while, and he's worried she really did pass out from the heat. What's going on, are you okay? He asks, and when there's no response again, he pulls open the shower curtain to find… nothing. Just an empty tub. There's no sign of his girlfriend anywhere. The man is beyond confused. He turns off the water and goes to the bedroom, but she isn't in there either. He runs to the front door, but it's still locked, and her keys are sitting on the table. He unlocks the door and sticks his head out into the hallway anyway, but nothing is out there. What is going on? He checks the bedroom again, then the bathroom, but she hasn't suddenly reappeared in either. He's in complete shock, unsure of what could be happening. He sits down on the toilet and puts his head in his hands. His head is spinning as it feels like the world is suddenly falling down all around him. The police are immediately suspicious of the man's story. His girlfriend simply vanished while taking a shower? You expect us to believe that? The detective asks. The man has no answer, though. It's as if she simply blinked out of existence. He's convinced she must still be in the building somewhere, that she somehow slipped out without him noticing. But none of the security footage from inside the building shows anything abnormal. There's footage from the cameras in the lobby of them entering the building, but nothing after that of her leaving. Just as in every missing person case like this, the boyfriend is the number one suspect. But without any evidence, they can't hold him any longer. After many long hours of interviews, they finally allow him to leave, but not back to the apartment, since it's an active crime scene. The man has no family to speak of, and his few friends seem to have the same suspicions as the police and want nothing to do with him. His girlfriend was the only person he truly had in the world, and now she's gone. He's put up in a shabby motel, and days pass, then weeks, then months, but no evidence of the missing woman ever turns up. The man replays the memory of that day over and over in his head, searching for some kind of answer, but try as he might, he can't remember anything helpful no clue as to what could have happened. The case is completely cold, and has been from the very start. The police eventually have to move on to newer, more solvable cases, and they finally allow the man to return home. He's overwhelmed with emotion the first time he enters the apartment. The place is a mess. It looks like the police turned it inside out looking for clues. Not knowing what else to do, he starts the long process of cleaning up the apartment. After hours of putting things away, he eventually gathers the strength to go to the one room he's been avoiding, the bathroom. He opens the door to the last place he's certain his girlfriend was. He enters to find that it looks like the rest of the apartment, as if someone has looked at every single object. But just like him, the police never found any trace of where she went. After straightening up this last room, he decides that he should take a shower and go to bed. It fills him with dread to think about standing in the last place he knows where she was, but he's had months to grieve the loss of his girlfriend and he's decided that he needs to move on, whatever that means when someone goes missing without a trace. He turns on the shower and lets the water heat up before stepping in. Once he's in, every thought he has is about her. He wonders if she ever actually got in the shower at all, or somehow used it as a diversion to slip out unseen. He just can't figure out how. The day's events race through his mind, just as they have a thousand times before, but his thoughts are interrupted when he notices that the water has started to pool around his feet. He looks down and sees that the drain cover looks normal. Maybe there's a clog, though. Do showers clog when they're not used? He has no idea. He bends down to get a closer look. The long, black creature emerges from the drain in the blink of an eye and latches onto his mouth, muffling him before he even has a chance to scream. He struggles and pulls down the curtain on top of him as he falls back onto the shower floor. But it's already too late. And in a matter of minutes, he too will be gone without a trace. Is there anything more comforting after a hard day than a nice, long, hot shower? The answer to that is no, there is nothing better. But that relaxing shower might just be the last you ever take 
when unbeknownst to you, your pipes are home to an instance of SCP-153, also known as drain worms. SCP-153 refers to a species that resembles the common nematode, or roundworm, consisting of a long, thin body with a large mouth on one end. While some roundworms can grow to as large as a meter long, which is in itself a disturbing thought, SCP-153 instances can be much, much larger, and it is estimated that they can reach up to nearly 10 meters in length, though it is hypothesized that some instances in the wild may grow even longer. These worm-like creatures will feed off of any available organic material, however, their favorite form of sustenance is fresh animal tissue, and they appear to have an especially strong predilection towards human flesh. In order to satiate their desire to feed on their preferred prey, SCP-153 has developed a rather unique predatory style that perfectly suits its elongated body structure. While it is unknown just where they originate, they are most often found in the pipes of sewer and drainage systems. 153 instances will swim up those pipes, seeking out ones that lead to people's homes, and especially those that connect to showers and bathtubs. Once they reach the end of the pipe, SCP-153 will latch onto the drain cover and begin secreting an acidic substance. The acid quickly dissolves the drain cover, and SCP-153 will position its own mouth in its place, which it then is able to camouflage as the missing drain cover almost perfectly. Once SCP-153 has taken this position, it is virtually impossible to distinguish it from the original or discern that anything has changed. SCP-153 will then lie in wait until it detects that someone has entered the shower or bathtub. Once the unsuspecting person has begun to bathe, it will very quickly emerge from the drain, latching onto the victim's face, most likely in order to prevent them from calling for help. It then begins to rapidly secrete more of the same acid that it used to dissolve the drain cover. With how effectively it was able to dissolve metal, it's no surprise that SCP-153 is able to quickly produce the same effect on its victim. Their skin, muscle, and bone will all be almost immediately liquefied, allowing SCP-153 to feed on the slurry, and the drain worms feed extremely quickly as well. After just several minutes, basically nothing will remain of the person who stepped into the shower, and 153 will retreat back into the drain, leaving no signs that it was ever there, save for the missing drain cover. The SCP Foundation became aware of this anomaly following multiple mysterious missing person cases that all had one key element in common. Each was reported as having disappeared after entering a bathroom to either shower or take a bath. The Foundation soon discovered that large populations of SCP-153 instances were living in the sewers beneath several major American cities and immediately began enacting containment procedures. The Foundation collected as many specimens as they could and brought them to Bioresearch Area 12 where they keep them contained in 10 by 10 by 5 meter tanks that are kept partially filled with sewage and other organic material for them to feed on. Of course, it is of the utmost importance that these containers are never connected to any other plumbing systems, either internal or external. With several specimens contained, the Foundation began researching the creatures in order to hopefully better understand them and how they were able to develop such complex hunting techniques. Research was also approved to find out whether they could be used as a sort of waste disposal system in certain extreme circumstances, such as with SCP-2717, a mass of living animal tissue that has grown to line nearly 4 kilometers of sewer pipes beneath Amsterdam. A small number of SCP-153 instances were approved for release into the wild in order to test whether they could stall the spread of 2717. However, this experiment was halted following some disturbing new reports. More missing person reports came to the Foundation's attention that bore the hallmarks of an SCP-153 attack, but these new reports were not limited to people who vanished after bathing. It now appears that SCP-153 has further adapted, and has begun to emerge not just from showers and bathtub drains, but now also from sinks and, yes, even toilets. The Foundation is unaware of just how many instances of SCP-153 continue to exist in the wild there's no doubt that many continue to live and hunt undetected in sewers around the world. This anomaly, which has been classified as Euclid, is taken very seriously by the Foundation, and any reports of people who go missing from bathrooms are immediately investigated for signs of SCP-153. Field agents are to be equipped with infrared and ultraviolet sensors which can bypass SCP-153's camouflage, and if specimens are able to be captured alive, then they are to be brought to Area 12 for further research. But don't bother worrying too much the next time you step into the tub. If you've been targeted by SCP-153, there's not much you'll be able to do anyway, and your worries will soon be going down the drain.
along with whatever remains of you. An SCP Foundation doctor wearing a hazmat suit is escorted by two guards through the secure facility. They stop in front of a large, sealed door, and one of the guards scans his security card. There's an audible hiss as the door slides open. The doctor nervously looks to the guard who motions him inside. They certainly won't be joining him. The doctor steps into the small airlock, and the door snaps shut. A complicated locking mechanism seals the door behind him. He's truly locked in. The reverse process then begins on the locked door in front of him. It finishes, and the door opens, revealing a room with bright lights that briefly blind the doctor. As his eyes adjust, he can see that the entire room is white and bathed in an intense light. He steps out of the airlock and towards the center of the room where his task awaits. He takes one slow step at a time, pausing for a moment after each before taking the next. The doctor wants to get this over with as quickly as possible, but he has to abide by the protocols, and this is how they dictate that one must walk in this containment chamber. As the doctor gets closer to the center, and his eyes further adjust to the bright light, he can finally see what this room contains. In the very middle of the room, directly under the lights, is a man. He's lying on a table and isn't moving at all, except for his slow, rhythmic breathing, which is assisted by the ventilator he's connected to. A feeding tube has been placed inside his nose, and numerous machines next to the man hum and beep as they measure his vital signs. The doctor continues to take one slow step after another, and eventually, after what feels like an eternity, he reaches the middle of the room. The lights above the man are angled to create large, dark shadows coming off of him, and now the doctor is finally close enough to make out what he was warned about in his briefings. Even though the man is completely still, the shadows are moving. Scurrying on the edges of the man's shadow are what look to be spiders, and big ones too, roughly three inches across. But the doctor can't see any actual spiders on the man. Only the shadows of these massive arachnids are visible as they move back and forth along the man's shadow. The doctor is growing increasingly nervous. He can feel the sweat dripping down the inside of his hazmat suit, though he tries to tell himself it's just a result of the bright lights beating down on him. The doctor reaches the machines measuring the man's vital signs and jots down their readings, marking down that the man's medically induced coma appears stable. He's continually distracted from his work, though, by the movement of the spiders. One suddenly jumps from one part of the man's shadow to another, startling the doctor and causing him to jump back. The spiders abruptly stop moving, and even though he can't see their eyes, he has the feeling that they are looking right at him. The doctor is frozen with fear, staring right back at the spiders, but after a moment, they go back to their previous behavior and start crawling along the edge of the comatose man's shadows once more. The doctor continues to go down his checklist and audibly gulps. He's reached the final item, the one labeled physical exam. Nervous sweat runs down his face into his eyes, and he wishes he wasn't wearing this hazmat suit so he could wipe it off. He knows he must get much closer to the man, and more importantly, his shadow, than he feels comfortable with. He has to physically take the man's pulse, though. They won't let him out of this room if he doesn't. He reaches out towards the man's hand, slowly and carefully. He can see the shadow of his hand getting dangerously close to the man's shadow, and the spiders. One of the spiders stops moving, as if it is watching and waiting for the doctor's shadow to get closer. It raises up on its hind legs, looking like it is ready to pounce. The doctor gets closer and closer to the man's hand, when out of nowhere, the room is rocked by an explosion. The doctor spins around, and on a monitor next to the airlock door, he can see a feed of the hallway outside. The guards who had escorted him run down the hall as a red emergency light flashes. He turns back to the man on the table. The spider that was waiting for him lowers itself out of its attack mode and goes back to scurrying along the shadow. The room is shaken by an even bigger explosion, and it suddenly goes dark. The power must have gone out from whatever is happening outside. He can hear the sound of muffled gunfire mixed with far-off screams, but both are drowned out by his nervous, heavy breathing inside of the suit. The doctor drops to the ground and tries to crawl back to the door, but he has no idea which direction it is. He hits his head hard and hears a crack come down his mask. That must have been the table. The doctor turns and crawls the other direction, eventually finding the airlock door. He stands up and bangs and pulls on the door, but it won't move. He fumbles with his hazmat suit and finds the button for his emergency light. 
A chemical light comes on inside of his suit, casting his face in a sickly yellow light. But the light starts to flicker. Something must be malfunctioning. The light on one side of his protective mask goes out, leaving half of his face in darkness. But that's the least of his problems, because all of his attention is now focused on the shadow moving across his face. It's the shadow of a spider. His eyes go wide as the spider stops and stands up on its rear legs. Arachnophobia, the fear of spiders, and sciophobia, the fear of shadows, are some of the most common phobias, and today's SCP file is a terrifying and dangerous combination of both. I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-538, also known as the Shadow Spiders. SCP-538 is what appears to be a kind of living shadow, not dissimilar to SCP-017, though these shadows always take the form of an unknown species of spider. These anomalous arachnids seek out the shadows cast by other living objects, attaching themselves to the edge of the living creature's shadow in such a way that their own shadows aren't obscured. Once attached to a shadow, the spiders will appear to feed off of them. This allows them to rapidly grow in size, with adults measuring a total area of roughly 15 square centimeters. Once they reach their full size, they will continue to feed, though this will only maintain their size. The feeding process seems to not impact the host in any way, and the spiders can remain on a shadow indefinitely. While the spiders have been observed feeding on the shadows of inanimate objects when no living creatures are available, these don't appear to provide the spiders with whatever nutrients they require and they will slowly atrophy and decrease in size. It is only when they are connected to the shadow of a living organism that SCP-538 can thrive. SCP-538 are not locked to the shadow they are on, though. The spiders have shown the ability to move across areas to reach a new host, though they will decrease in size when not attached to a shadow, losing as much as two square centimeters of their size for every second that they aren't on a shadow. And should they be stranded in the open without a shadow to feed on, they will decrease in size until they disappear completely, at which point that individual instance of SCP-538 is considered to be terminated. The spiders normally avoid this fate thanks to their extremely fast movement though, and fully grown instances have been measured moving up to 1 meter per second. While SCP-538 instances are usually quite benign, seeming content to simply live on the shadow of their host, they will attack if they are frightened which is when the real danger presented by these anomalous arachnids comes to light. If the spiders are agitated, usually from the result of a rapid movement by its host, the spider will bite the organism's shadow before attempting to flee. Once bitten, the unlucky individual will progress through five distinct stages, all of which take place over the course of roughly one hour. During the first, the subject will report pain in the area of their body that corresponds to the part of their shadow that was bitten but no puncture wounds or other marks will be visible in this location. Minor psychological effects have been reported in this stage, mostly consisting of an increase in irritability and the tendency for the bitten subject to lash out at those around them. The second stage occurs 10 to 15 minutes after being bitten. The subject will begin sweating, despite reporting that they feel cold, while their skin will become red and warm to the touch. 25 to 30 minutes after the bite, the third stage will begin. At this point, the psychological effects become very noticeable, with the subject becoming violent and attempting to attack any person nearby. Their speech will be slurred, and they may show signs of impairment to their motor skills. The fourth stage begins at the 40 to 45 minute mark, and at this point, the subject's skin color will go from being red to a pale white as their core temperature drops 5 to 8 degrees Celsius. Their psychological state will alter once again and they will go from being extremely aggressive to overly apologetic, blaming their previous behavior on the fact that they weren't feeling well and weren't acting like themselves. After offering their apologies, they will then request their leave from the area and attempt to retreat to a darkened area. The fifth and final stage happens 55 to 60 minutes after the bite, at which point the subject faces a grisly end to the entire ordeal. Their entire body will rapidly dissolve into a translucent liquid while at the exact same time, their shadow will disintegrate into numerous smaller instances of SCP-538. The spider offspring measure just 4 centimeters across, and the new instances will immediately begin seeking out shadows of their own that they can attach to and feed off of. There is currently no known cure for being bitten by an SCP-538 instance, and even death will not halt the process. 
Instead, should the subject expire while in the earlier stages of the condition, death will cause the final step to occur immediately. In a bit of good news, only bites to the area of an individual's shadow that correspond to a spot of bare skin seem to cause these effects. Even thin materials like cotton clothing appear to be enough to prevent the process from starting. The SCP Foundation has multiple instances of SCP-538 in containment, and they are kept in a white 15 by 15 by 3 meter room that is accessible only via an airlock. Four 200 watt lights are focused on a table in the center of the room, where D-Class personnel in a medically induced coma is kept in a stable state, in order to serve as a feeding source for the SCP-538 specimens. No other sources of shade are allowed into the room, so that the D-Class serves as the only source of shadows. Any personnel that enter the room, whether to repair a light source or to check on the condition of the D-Class, are to wear sealed hazardous material suits equipped with oxygen tanks, and are advised that they must move slowly and deliberately in order to avoid agitating any instances of SCP-538. Initially, doctors sent to examine the D-Class personnel were allowed to enter the room alone. However, following the events of Incident I-538-1, that protocol has been changed. During the incident, an attack by the Chaos Insurgency caused disruptions to both the main and backup power sources to the part of the site where the SCP-538 containment cell is located, just as a Foundation doctor was in the middle of an examination of the comatose D-Class. Power outage led to all lights in the containment cell shutting off, while at the same time sealing the airlock that provides the only means in or out of the room and trapping the doctor inside. The power was not able to be restored to the containment cell for another 18 hours, at which point the doctor was finally removed from the cell. The doctor sobbed uncontrollably as he kept repeating that he could feel them crawling all over him. The doctor was required to attend mandatory psychological therapy for his newly developed arachnophobia and was later reassigned. Following this incident, the examination protocol was updated and health checkups of the D-Class personnel are now performed by a doctor who is accompanied in the cell by two security personnel, each of whom are equipped with two 250-watt flashlights that can be used in the event of another disruption to the lights. If at any time a staff member is bitten by one of the spiders, they are to be immediately placed within SCP-538's containment cell as soon as possible, as the failure to properly contain them could easily lead to a massive containment breach by SCP-538 entities. Bitten individuals will often attempt to hide the fact that they are bitten, so anyone who comes into contact with the shadow spiders must be carefully monitored for signs of any of the symptoms that follow a bite. The ease with which they could quickly spread, and the huge threat they pose to humanity, has led to SCP-538 being classified as Euclid, and while the Foundation hopes that they have been successfully contained, we all must remain ever vigilant of movement on the edge of shadows. Should you spot something, don't take any chances. Your future, non-liquefied body will thank you for it. It is November of 1966 in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. It's a crisp, clear night, the kind of natural beauty only autumn in Appalachia can bring. The lush green mountainsides have gone fiery as the season changed from summer to fall, vivid oranges, reds, and yellows flooding the landscape and turning the hills into a sunset. Now, in the dim light of the moon, the colors are muted, but still glorious, dancing in a silvery blue glow. The spooky fun of Halloween has come and gone, leaving the warm, cozy feelings of the harvest, of fresh pressed apple cider, corn mazes filled with happy families, cuddling up around a fire with a flannel blanket and a mug of something hot and sweet. Some people think Christmas is the most romantic time of the year, or Valentine's Day, or spring, when the wildflowers bloom and the breeze carries their perfume through the town. But to at least one happy couple, this is the most romantic thing they could possibly imagine. They're a young man and a young woman, driving down the winding country road. They're so in love, and they feel like the only two people in the entire world. At this moment, life is good. They're driving just to drive, to crank up the radio and enjoy being alone together. But after a long stretch of road with nothing much in sight, they decide to drive a little bit further away from town, over toward an area nicknamed the TNT area, for its former life as a World War II munitions plant site. Now, of course, it's just mostly wildlife out there, but it'll look beautiful at night, and it should be completely private. As the car winds around a curve in the road, the woman thinks she sees something out of the corner of her eye, and her heart skips a beat, taking her back to long-forgotten childhood fears. As a little kid, she always used to get nervous driving at night, 
imagining a monster running alongside the car as it went, trying to catch her. She used to picture long, pale limbs and big eyes, something loping along on all fours, dipping in and out of sight between the moonlight and the shadows. She would have nightmares about what the creature might do if it ever caught up to the car, if it ever reached through the window and pulled her out into the darkness. But of course, that was just a flight of fancy, the sort of thing a bored child's mind cooks up on a long drive. Imagining monsters where there are just dead tree branches or nocturnal animals. But now, seeing motion in the forest out the window, she feels that same breathless terror she felt as a little girl. She doesn't even realize she's squeezing her boyfriend's hand too tight until he pulls it away with a wince. Easy, before you crush me. He laughs, but there's worry in his eyes. You okay? She nods, shaking off the feeling. Sure, I'm fine. She privately chides herself for being so silly, for letting her own imagination get the better of her. She's lived in Point Pleasant all her life. She's no stranger to wildlife. Animals come out at night sometimes. It's just as much their world to live in as it is hers, she reminds herself. She's just starting to settle in, to let herself relax, when she sees it again. A fluttering motion, like great big dark wings, flapping at the edge of the area illuminated by the headlights. Something about it, the way it moves, the way it shimmers in the light that seems to shine right through it like black mist, it feels deeply wrong. Like the old stories her grandfather used to tell her about the things you see in the mountains late at night, things you never want to come close to. He'd once told her about a mountain lion with the face of a woman or a deer he watched stand up on its hind legs. She'd never seen anything quite like that, but the feeling he described, the deep sense of the unnatural, the way her mind and body recoil instinctively from this sight, feels the same. Did you see that? She asks, her throat so tight that her voice comes out in a whisper. Her boyfriend shakes his head. See what? Their deer out there? You know, a deer completely wrecked my last car, ran right into me. He was fine, got up and walked off like nothing happened. Me, on the other hand. No, it wasn't a deer. She shakes her head. Never mind, it's silly. But the little break in her voice makes him pause. He turns the wheel, pulling the car over by the side of the road, and parks there. Hey, look at me. What's got you so shaken up? He puts a hand on her shoulder, giving it a comforting squeeze. I just, I thought I saw something. She sighs, feeling absurd as she says it out loud. Well, you probably did. All kinds of animals out here. But it's fine, they're more scared of us than we are of them, he reassures her. She shakes her head, frowning. No, I know that. It wasn't an animal, I think. I couldn't quite see it, but I got this awful feeling. All the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Whatever I got a glimpse of, I can't explain it. I just feel like there was something wrong, like it wasn't supposed to be here. She rests her face in her hands, struggling to find the words. He rubs her back, unsure what else to do, what else to say. They sit like that for a long while, before she finally sits back up. Want to go home? He asks. She nods weakly. I'm sorry. I know you wanted to go driving more. It's a new car. He cuts her off. I want to do what you want to do. Come on, let's go by the diner and get a couple burgers. See if they've got any cherry pie left. Sound good? She nods. Sounds great. The young man is just about to put the car back in drive when there is a sudden fluttering motion, something moving through the headlights beam. This time, they both see it and they can only watch wide-eyed as it settles to a stop directly in front of their car. There, the size of a grown man with a 10-foot wingspan is something unlike anything they have ever seen before. It's massive, dark gray, its face shielded from view by the limited light, with one notable exception. Boring into them are a pair of glowing red eyes, wide and piercing. Then, with a flap of its wings, as quickly as it appeared, the strange thing is gone again. The couple sit in complete silence for a long time, before they turn to look at each other. They don't speak, but their expressions both say the same thing. You saw that too, right? Still too shocked to speak, the young man cranks the engine with trembling hands, and the two speed off back down the deserted road toward town. They have to get back. They have to call the police and tell them… what? That they saw a monster? A flying man with glowing eyes? Will anyone even believe them? Suddenly, the young woman's voice breaks through the tense quiet in the car. Behind us! She cries out. The man glances in the rearview mirror and sees what he would assume were red headlights if he didn't already recognize them. Sure enough, the massive thing is flying behind their car, following them along the road. The car takes a turn, and so does the creature. The car speeds up, and it flaps its wings to catch up to them. It doesn't do anything else, doesn't try to grab them or break the back windshield, it just follows them, watching with an expression that he could almost call curiosity. Then, after five tense miles, it just disappears again, and they're alone. 
truly alone. That chill on the back of their necks is gone, and they know that wherever that creature came from, it's gone back there, at least for now. When they make it back to town, they pull into the police station and rush inside. They can hardly get their words out as they try to tell the officer on duty what exactly they saw. He's skeptical, of course. Two scared kids seeing things that aren't there, he assumes. But they insist again and again that they know what they saw. He humors them, listens to their story, and suggests that it was some sort of large wild bird. Animals' eyes reflect light, he reminds them. And everything looks worse at night, especially when someone is already all worked up. Realizing they won't be believed, the couple head home and get ready for bed. But they don't sleep. They can't. All they can think about is that massive figure landing right in front of their car and staring directly at them. Its unbelievable wingspan, its speed, the strange interest it had shown in following them home until it disappeared without a trace. What did it want? Will it ever come back? As they lie in bed, staring up at the ceiling and replaying the events of the night again and again in their minds, they wonder if they'll ever get the answers to those questions. One thing is for certain, though. They'll never forget those eyes as long as they live. Contrary to what the police officer thought about their story, this pair of young lovers were not the only ones to see the strange, winged creature around Point Pleasant. Over the next month, Others reported seeing similar things, and soon, eyewitness accounts were pouring in on a regular basis. A pair of volunteer firemen saw it while on duty, describing a massive bird with bright red eyes. A police officer reported seeing an unusually large bird-like animal with eyes that reflected the glow from his flashlight. A group of gravediggers doing their work looked up from their shovels to see something large, dark, and winged fly through the sky overhead, temporarily blotting out the moon. It soared overhead and landed in a far-off tree. All over town, people reported sightings of the creature, and the story grew and grew. The sheriff tried to calm the townspeople down, positing that it was just a sandhill crane, a large bird with a seven-foot wingspan and reddish coloring around its eyes. But the reports kept coming in, and they only got more bizarre. Some said it could fly over 100 miles per hour. Others said it could appear and disappear at will. A man in Salem, West Virginia blamed the creature for strange patterns appearing on the screen of his television set and for strange noises he heard outside of his home at night. Then came the strange being's most infamous appearance. Eyewitnesses saw it, a massive, shadowy winged figure, on the night of December 15th, flying over the Silver Bridge, a suspension bridge over the Ohio River. Soon after this sighting, the bridge collapsed and 46 people lost their lives. Though a fracture in the suspension chain was the culprit, people whispered around town that this mysterious creature was somehow responsible. If not responsible, then the monster was at least connected. It had to be. How could it be a coincidence? This mysterious apparition grew to be known as the Mothman, or simply Mothman. But to the SCP Foundation, it had a different name, SCP-2901. And according to their findings, there wasn't just one Mothman, but an entire species. SCP-2901 refers to a species of carnivorous scavenger creatures that, thus far, have demonstrated limited intelligence. They stand at an average height of 1.7 meters and generally appear to have an ellipsoidal shape with two large red eyes covered in photophoric tissue. Their bodies are covered in tiny iridescent scales, similar to those found in moths, butterflies, and other insects belonging to the Lepidoptera order. They are not bound by standard rules of space or time and are able to move through both at will. This gives them seemingly impossible abilities such as levitation, flight, teleportation, and the emission of an acoustic cancellation effect thought to help them avoid detection. In spite of these talents, they are still impervious to some ordinary forces, such as standard firearms. Due to their unique abilities making them especially elusive, these creatures have proven difficult to contain using conventional methods. Not only that, but it has become increasingly difficult over time to keep the general public from discussing the possibility of their existence. The first appearance of SCP-2901 on record occurred in West Virginia in 1967, shortly before the catastrophic collapse of the Silver Bridge. Since then, SCP-2901 instances have gone out of their way to avoid humans, keeping to themselves as much as possible and vanishing from sight when approached. However, they have continued to manifest near the sites of various disasters, appearing to a handful of eyewitnesses in the location approximately a week to a month before something terrible occurs there. Somehow, through a predictive ability compared by some researchers to a sense of smell, they are able to detect when an event resulting in multiple fatalities will occur. 
Once they have first appeared in an area, the creatures will remain there and guard it until the disaster comes to pass. They are extremely territorial, fighting with each other for dominance over the area, and even changing their shapes to frighten humans that wander into their territory. Once the disaster has occurred, the instances of SCP-2901 in the area will scavenge the dead until there is no more food left for them. Then, they will disappear once and for all, leaving no trace behind. Because SCP-2901 cannot be physically contained, the SCP Foundation has instead put guidelines in place for managing the creature's appearances, as well as what to do if an agent encounters one of these ethereal beings in the field. Cases involving SCP-2901 are assigned to Mobile Task Force 55, also known as the Twilighters. Not to be confused with fans of a certain young adult vampire romance series. Any civilian encounters with SCP-2901 should be addressed with standard amnestic procedures, and any media leaks regarding the creatures such as social media posts, YouTube videos, or local news reports will be deleted or otherwise countered by the Information Detraction, Censorship, and Rescission Division. Field agents have been instructed to avoid SCP-2901 if possible, and carry mobile devices capable of SMS messaging in the event of one of the creatures using acoustic cancellation. If an operative comes face-to-face -face with an instance of SCP-2901, and there is no way to avoid a direct confrontation, there are specific steps that they must follow in order to minimize casualties. First, do not attempt to run away from the creature, lest it be provoked to chase after you. Second, hold your ground and maintain eye contact. Do not show weakness. Third, make a threat display, similar to the display the creatures use to frighten civilians away. Use your clothing to make yourself look bigger, stand on your tiptoes, and spread your arms wide. Continue this step until SCP-2901 either loses interest or is intimidated into standing down. If the creature approaches, do whatever you can to keep from touching it. Throw objects or brandish a makeshift weapon if you must. Though they do not tend to deliberately harm living humans, the fluctuating nature of the creature's position in space and time causes direct physical contact between them and a the human to result in a dermal fusion. Essentially, they become stuck together. But the creature does not realize this. When they then attempt to flee and leave the human behind, the results are… painful, to say the least. Imagine the feeling of ripping off a large band-aid. Now multiply that by a thousand, and multiply again. One more time? That's what it feels like. Though these guidelines were put together with Foundation field operatives in mind, they may come in handy for any civilian who accidentally crosses paths with SCP-2901. Should you find yourself in that unfortunate position, I hope that this information will help you avoid unnecessary trauma and pain. One more thing. I initially believed the preceding information to be all the available research into the nature of SCP-2901. However, after obtaining some additional security clearance through methods I won't detail here out of concern for the safety of all involved, I was able to locate this classified entry into its official file. It is a missive from the Information Detraction, Censorship, and Rescission Division, and details a practice of containment known as Operation Surgeon's Photograph, intended to act as a public disinformation campaign regarding the nature of SCP-2901. The purpose of this operation is not to conceal information about SCP-2901 from the public, but rather to control the information they have access to. A summary of the operation's methodology and ongoing success was included, and reads as follows. SCP-2901's current evolution is the sum of Foundation efforts in manipulating its existence through public perception. SCP-2901 are a group of extra-dimensional entities that lack a stable cohesive form and purpose that only coalesces through continued observational reconciliation. For SCP-2901 to maintain a stable physical mass, approximately 75% of the nearby human populace within 500 kilometers need to be congruent on a singular concept of what SCP-2901 is and what it does. SCP-2901 were first discovered and categorized as highly unstable Keter-class entities, capable of producing localized CK-class scenarios at random. Further research into SCP-2901's unstable manifestations proved to be futile, as, unbeknownst to Foundation scientists at the time, SCP-2901 would involuntarily change during each subsequent observation. During a containment breach into the civilian populated areas within the Appalachian region of the southern United States, SCP-2901 began gradually condensing into a singular manifestation the more it was exposed to humans. Civilians began conceding to the idea that SCP-2901 was a dark, winged-like humanoid with large red eyes, which corresponded to pre-existing local folklore. 
SCP-2901 also began to evolve predatory-like behaviors and anomalous acoustic effects that conceptualized due to the mass fear generated within the surrounding communities. Foundation researchers recognized the effects and began isolating SCP-2901 as much as possible. However, deprived of regular perceptual input, SCP-2901 began to devolve into its initial highly unstable manifestations once again. The decision was made to maintain SCP-2901 in a functioning, manageable state through continued exposure to human perceptual belief that SCP-2901 is a tangible creature of local folklore, another Bigfoot or Loch Ness Monster. The nearby Silver Bridge collapse of 1967 and the SCP-2901 Appalachian incursion, in reality, have no connection with one another. However, public opinion strongly disagreed, and henceforth SCP-2901 began to appear at other future disaster events. This was the precursor of the precognitive scavenging animal-like behavior that is observed today. Efforts are to continue gradually introducing notions developed by the Foundation as to further SCP-2901's evolution into a more docile and manageable concept. I'm not sure I appreciate the implication that Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster don't exist. I, for one, am still holding out hope. But this finding still does compel me. Belief is a powerful thing. It can shape the world around us in unexpected ways, and apparently can even shift the nature of an entire race of creatures that otherwise refuse to abide by our rules and our understanding. Who knows what these beings will look like, how they will behave a few years down the line. For now, they are shadowy, precognitive scavengers, waiting in the wings for humanity to encounter disaster, then picking up the leftovers for themselves. They may not mean us any harm, but the sight of them can and should still strike terror into the heart. If you're ever out on your own and you spot a wide pair of glowing red eyes in the darkness, hear the rustle of leaves, of something floating through the trees like a cloud of black mist, you should probably leave that place immediately. You won't want to be there for what's coming next, because whether it takes a day or a month, SCP-2901 only goes where it knows it will be fed. All he could see were glimpses, flashes of movement, but he could clearly make out that there was a girl. He could see the man walk up behind her and slip a bag over her head. There was a struggle, a body being dragged through the dark, and then the sound of a shovel scraping against the hard dirt. The body is thrown into the shallow hole, and as the dirt begins to rain down on her face, her eye opens up. The boy's eyes open too, and he sits up with a panicked jolt. Shaky and covered in sweat, he looks around his dark room and realizes that it was only a dream. The entire morning as the boy gets ready, rides the bus, and sits through school, all he can think about is the dream and the girl. A group of teenage girls are out for a ride in one of their father's sports car convertible. They're having too much fun and driving much too fast down the dark country roads. It doesn't take much, it never does. Just the shadow of an animal bolting across the road, but it's enough to make the driver jerk the wheel, causing the car to lose control. All of the girls scream, but none more than the one who is tossed from the sliding, spinning car. The girls stand around their dead friend and make a solemn pact. No one here will ever know that she was with them. But what will they do with her? One of them points towards the woods, and everyone turns to look at the dilapidated shed. As the girls, now dirty from their long night of digging and then filling a hole, emerge from the shed into the dim morning light, none of them are aware that beneath the dirt, the girl is still breathing. The boy gasps for air and struggles in the dark. He throws the blankets off of him before realizing that he is safe in his own bed. Another breakfast, another ride to school, another day of classes where the boy can think of nothing but the girl from his dreams. Who is she? He's never seen her in his life, he's sure of it. But then why does she keep appearing in his dreams? The boy is snapped out of his deep train of thought by the teacher slapping his desk, and he apologizes before focusing on his studies once again. The look on the woman's face is a mix of sadness and annoyance. She doesn't know how much longer she can go on like this. It never stops. How can someone cough so much? The woman sits in her chair and tries to push away the same thought that comes to her over and over, that it would be better for both of them if it would just end. The girl coughs loudly in her bed. The disease has ravaged her lungs, and it takes all of her willpower not to scratch at the burning, itching sores on her face and chest. She looks towards the door with dazed eyes and sees her mother enter the room. She's carrying a tray with soup, just like she always does at this time, even though she has no appetite at all. As her mother gets closer, she can see that the tray is empty, 
and it isn't a tray in her hands. It's a pillow. The girl can barely muster a scream as the woman places the pillow over her daughter's face. As the mother walks out of the old shed in the backyard and towards the house, she stops for a moment. Can she hear the sound of coughing coming from the shed? That morning at breakfast, the boy's father tells him in no uncertain terms that he doesn't want to hear any more about the girl. It's just a dream and he needs to put it out of his mind. What he needs to be focusing on is school. The note from his teacher said that he isn't paying attention in class, and if that keeps up, he's going to have much bigger problems. The boy promises, no more about the girl. As the boy stares out the bus window, it isn't his fault that thoughts about his dream rush into his head. Because as the bus drives along the country roads, he catches a glimpse of something down a long, tree-covered driveway. It's the house from his dream. The shed door opens with a creak, allowing a sliver of light from the full moon to fall inside. The boy enters the shed as quietly as he can and goes inside. He soon emerges with his bike and a shovel strapped to his back before riding away from his own backyard into the night. The boy stops his bike at the bottom of the driveway leading up to the old abandoned house. He rides up the drive and doesn't even consider stopping at the house. His destination is somewhere else. The boy lets his bike fall to the ground in the backyard and stares at it. It's the shed he's seen so many times before, despite never seeing it in person. It's dark and quiet, the shed silhouetted against the large, bright moon. He approaches the only door on the small shed and reaches for the handle. It opens with a loud, rusty squeak. The boy takes out a flashlight and turns it on, illuminating the shed's interior. Inside is nothing except for a wooden bench sitting on the dirt floor. But wait, there is something else. A spot on the ground appears different, blackened, almost as if it were burned. This is the spot, though. This is the place the boy keeps seeing in his dreams. He knows she's down there. She needs his help. The boy thrusts his shovel down into the dirt, but it doesn't even scratch the surface. The ground is cold and hard. He strikes down again, and the shovel pierces into the dirt. The shovel suddenly falls to the ground, though, as the boy begins to cough. He drops to his knees as the coughing becomes a fit. He can't stop, and now he can't breathe. It feels like his throat is filling with something. He falls to the ground, still coughing as he feels whatever is filling his throat and lungs moving and vibrating. The final great hacking cough, he unleashes a swarm of creatures from his mouth. He lies in the dirt, struggling but unable to get any air, as the buzz of thousands of locusts drowns out his final noises. It's no surprise that what this young man ran into wasn't a dream at all, but an interaction with an anomaly that has since been classified as SCP-4595 but also has the quite simple and appropriate name of Witch. SCP-4595 is the designation given to a small room located inside of a woodshed that is itself found behind a home near the town of Jasper, Indiana. The house appears to have been abandoned for some time, and there are no reliable records of who the home's most recent or original owners were. The only item inside the woodshed is a simple, rough-hewn wooden bench, though at the time of the anomaly's discovery, Two other objects were found as well. The first was a small shovel, the type that might be used for gardening. The shovel appears to be ordinary in every way, except for the very tip which has what looks to be a blood stain on it, though tests have been unable to retrieve any genetic material from the discoloration. The second object was a small human skeleton. The body of the deceased person was removed from the woodshed, and an autopsy revealed that it had belonged to an adolescent male, roughly 11 to 13 years old. While the exact cause of death was unable to be determined, it is extremely likely that it was due to the anomalous effects that SCP-4595 produces, but more on those in a moment. Further examination of the woodshed reveals that the word witch has been scrawled on the door with charcoal, though it is unknown who wrote the message and whether it is meant to serve as a warning or has some other purpose. It is highly likely, though, that the word is referring to the final element of SCP-4595, the body that is buried beneath the woodshed's dirt floor. Ground-penetrating imaging tools were brought in to investigate the shed, and researchers discovered that underneath one portion of the floor that appears to have been scorched at some point, a body is buried roughly one meter beneath the surface, which has since been designated as SCP-4595-A. Scans have revealed the body to be a humanoid figure, vaguely feminine in appearance. Its limbs are twisted in a painful and unnatural manner, there are several large wounds present on its face, chest, and neck. But perhaps strangest of all is that despite evidence at the site pointing to the location not having been disturbed for many years, the corpse buried beneath 
does not seem to show any signs at all of decomposition, still appearing as it most likely did at the time it was interred in the ground. You are most likely asking yourself why the SCP Foundation has relied solely on subterranean imaging in order to assess the state of SCP-4595-A, and why they don't simply dig up the anomalous corpse. The reason why they haven't is due to the anomalous effects present at the site. Testing on SCP-4595 has concluded that anyone who enters the shed and remains there for any substantial amount of time will begin to experience a number of effects. First, they will start to feel paranoid getting the impression that someone is watching them. This purely mental effect is quickly followed by a physical one, where the individual's skin will start to itch. Those who linger in SCP-4595 long enough will eventually begin to violently scratch at themselves in an attempt to relieve the itchiness. These effects, while very uncomfortable, will eventually subside if they leave the location, and it is very likely that they are meant to serve as a warning of what will happen if one partakes in the most dangerous aspect of SCP-4595 which is disturbing the body buried beneath it. Anyone who attempts to impact SCP-4595-A by attempting to dig it up or otherwise remove it from the location will quickly experience a horrendous anomalous effect. The individual will soon find that they are experiencing a shortness of breath and soon will begin coughing and choking and be unable to breathe at all. This is due to a phenomenon in which any empty space in their chest cavity, lungs, airways, stomach, and intestines will completely fill with Schistocerca gregaria, better known as the desert locust. The insects will continue to appear within the individual's body until they expire, a process that typically takes mere minutes. Any locusts that manage to escape the individual's body, most often through the mouth and nose, will disappear into a vapor that quickly dissipates the moment they cross the threshold of the woodshed's doorway. So far, no method has been determined that can prevent any of SCP-4595's effects, and for the time being, no personnel are allowed to enter the anomalous shed except for testing purposes, but even in those cases, the disturbance of SCP-4595-A is not allowed. Due to the relative ease with which the Foundation can secure the site and is able to prevent anyone from entering, it has been classified as safe, with the additional disruption class of dark and the risk class of warning. Just what is SCP-4595? Is the SCP-4595-A body a victim, doomed to an eternity beneath this ramshackle shed? Or is it a monster, sealed away for some unknown purpose, the only warning for us to stay away being a single word on the door? Maybe one day we'll finally know the answer to why SCP-4595 is only known as the Witch. What is it that you want? Not just what you want in this moment. That's fleeting. You get it and move on. Or you don't and you forget. No. What do you want? What do you yearn for? That humming dissatisfaction that underscores every moment of your life. The constant rumbling, always beneath the surface, that you can never put your finger on. Behind your computer monitor, at the bottom of your $4 coffee. That quiet moment when you go to the toilet at a friend's wedding and look at yourself in the mirror, asking, why am I not happy yet? This moment, this object, this feeling that I was looking forward to, why does it feel empty? A night in with your best friends, a promotion at work, a new car, a new house, all empty. So when I ask you again, I want you to be serious. None of that fake surface level fleeting drivel. What is it that you want? What will genuinely make you happy? The words buzz around the student's head. He hasn't listened to a word of this lecture, not for a moment. Last night's therapy session had clearly struck a bit too close to home. He'd never expected this new therapist to be so direct. What was it that he really wanted? The student looks down at his laptop. He'd really wanted that. He'd spent months researching it, holding off on buying other models, waiting and saving up for the perfect computer. And here it is, with the same old boring lecture notes on the screen as his old one. Within a week, he'd been back online looking up new phones. Here he is, 21 years old already, and studying for a degree he doesn't really care about. Surrounded by happy, smiling students who are all clearly going to be far more successful and happy than he'll ever be. 
Beautiful people everywhere he looks. People who know how to dress well, know how to have a conversation, how to smile and laugh with friends, how to have friends in the first place. His therapist is right. What's he got to be happy about? That dissatisfied humming running through his life is steadily turning into a roar. What would actually make him happy? The more he thinks about it, the more the sense of dread creeps in. What has he actually got to look forward to in life? What can fill that void? The lecture is over. He hadn't even realized. Everyone around him is already on their feet, putting notepads and laptops into bags, chatting away with their friends. The student doesn't have anyone else in his row. He's somehow picked the only row in the lecture hall with just one person in it. No, that's not the case. This is the only row in the lecture with just one person in it, because he picked it. His only company on this row? A fly. A fly that had been following him around all week. What's the point? He looks at his laptop screen. Empty. His phone buzzes. It's his mom. He declines the call. Swinging his bag onto his shoulder, the student makes his way to the door. A group of guys up ahead are chatting loudly as they open it. One of them half glances back over his shoulder. He stops in the doorway, holding the door open. The student looks around. No one else was with him. Who's this guy holding the door open for? You okay? The guy asks, looking straight at the student. His eyes are very blue. The student rushes through the doorway, muttering a thank you on his way through. His phone starts to ring again in his pocket. He sits up alone that night. He does the same most nights. Even if he wanted to, he wouldn't be able to fall asleep. Sharing a house with seven other people, there's a party happening in one part of the house pretty much every night. The thumping bass is the only sound to reach the student as he sits quietly at his window, looking out at the bags of trash lining the street and the couple across from him arguing on their porch. The little fly in his room is the only one keeping him company, not buzzing around or trying to escape through the glass, just sitting there next to him, watching the world go by. What is it that you really want? The words ring around in his head again. Tell me what will make you truly happy. What is it? I think… I think I just want someone to love me, the student says quietly. He sits quietly by the window for a few more minutes, not noticing as the little fly next to him catches fire and rolls onto its back, legs curled in the air. The student just goes to bed. Nothing's ever going to change, is it? A week later, the student is back in that same lecture again. He arrived early this week, sitting down and unpacking his stuff a good fifteen minutes before they were due to start. Surreptitiously as he can, the student glances over at the door every time he hears it swing open. It's the usual procession of beautiful, happy people, each one dressed exactly how they want, personalities, goals, and aspirations filling each of them. He looks down at his outfit. Gray. The lecture starts, but the student still can't quite focus. He keeps his head half-turned towards the door the whole time, waiting. Ten minutes go by. Nothing. He slumps down in his chair and starts taking notes, just as the door softly creeps open behind him, making a gentle hushing noise on the carpet. The student turns. There he is, the guy from before with the blue eyes. The student tries his best to swallow his grin. He's the only one in his row. If he can just get the guy's attention, maybe he'll come and sit with him. But no, that's a stupid plan. Why would anyone want to come and… The bag lands in the seat next to him. The student turns to see those same piercing blue eyes. Anyone sitting here? The guy whispers. The student opens his mouth to reply, but the words get stuck. After a second, he manages to shake his head. The guy with the blue eyes grins and sinks into the seat. After a moment, he asks if he can borrow a pen. That's funny. The student can see a pen right there in the side pocket of the guy's bag. Why would this guy choose to sit with him? There are plenty of free seats in this lecture hall. They're everywhere. One thing's for sure. The student definitely can't talk to this guy afterwards. No way. He's too weird. It'll be obvious. No one ever wants to have a conversation with him. Everyone he talks to is always sidling their way out of the room after just a couple of minutes. Besides, what if this guy finds out what he's really like? That he's been seeing a therapist? Not just a therapist. That would be pretty normal. Normal people do that. No, what if this guy found out that his therapist was a fly? A fly that had been following him around, that he'd been talking to every night before bed. A fly that had been asking him what his deepest desires were. A fly that he'd woken up to find dead and burnt on his windowsill this morning. Nope, no way is he going to have a conversation with this guy. It would just be a disaster. There's no other option. He has to call his mom. As soon as the lecture is over, he'll call her and deal with whatever it is she has to say. 
He takes the phone out of his pocket and stealthily gets his mom's contact details up, ready to hit the call button as soon as the lecture finishes. There, the final slide. The student hits dial and immediately turns away from the blue-eyed guy next to him, getting up and putting it to his ear. He shoulders his bag and marches out of the lecture hall, not looking back until he reaches the little square of grass outside where he sits. His heart doesn't stop hammering until he's sitting there. His mom takes a long time to pick up. When she does, it's clear that she's been crying. Not this again. The student swallows and prepares for her to start ranting. Only she doesn't. Instead, she just asks where he is and if she can drive over and get a coffee with him. He says yes, hangs up, and looks down at the phone, brow furrowed. What she got to say to him this time? A shadow falls over him. Turning, the student just sees two blue eyes. The guy is holding out the borrowed pen, a gentle smile on his face. His mom doesn't come for coffee in the end. Instead, she invites herself over to his house. It's the first time she's visited. As they make their way up all the flights of stairs to his floor, the student holds his breath, waiting for her to start complaining about the cigarette butts, ashtrays, and pizza boxes lining the hallways. But she doesn't. She doesn't say a word. He closes the door to his room behind her, and she lets out a sympathetic little sigh looking around. He probably should have tidied first. Here it comes. He can feel it. She's about to start lecturing him on his dirty clothes, leftover dishes, his unmade bed. But no. She just quietly picks up a sweater and starts folding it. Then another. As she tidies his room, she shoots him a sad little smile. This house really won't do. He explains to her that it's all he can afford at the moment. Well, then let me help you so you can find somewhere better. What's going on here? He doesn't know how to react. This is surely one of her games. Any second she's going to lash out at him. But no. She just gently brushes the dead fly off the windowsill into the trash and turns to him. They stand across the room from each other, the same way they always have, eight feet between them. Plenty of space, not too close. She closes the distance and pulls him in for a tight hug. As his mom buries her head in his chest, he notices for the first time how short she really is. Has she always been that height? Didn't she used to tower over him? Her muffled voice speaks into his chest, right into where his heart is beating. I'm so sorry for how I responded before. I didn't know what to say. You're my son, and I'm proud of you. I always have been. You love who you love. Don't let anyone take that away from you, even your silly old mother. For a long time, the two of them stand there, crying together. It is a busy week moving everything into his new apartment. It's still a pretty basic place, but at least it's his own. The neighbors are quiet, the street is clean, and there are no flies. By the time the student sits down for his lecture, he's completely exhausted. He barely registers the bag landing on the floor next to him and the guy sitting in the seat. He's so tired, in fact, that the conversation catches him off guard. He hadn't prepared anything to say. But suddenly, they're talking. About the weather at first. It's sunnier now. Then about the class. Then why they chose to study here. Then their teenage years. Then their homes and families. The lecture starts, but the two of them keep muttering away to each other in hushed tones. The student cracks a joke, and the guy with blue eyes laughs. Properly laughs. He isn't just being polite. He actually found it funny. So funny that the lecturer tells the pair of them off which just makes them laugh more. Is this what it's like? To be one of the beautiful, happy people? Days go by, and the student wakes up every morning expecting it to be over. He's going to wake up any minute now, and he'll be back in his old house with a talking fly waiting for him by the window. But he doesn't. It's sunny, day after day, week after week, no flies in sight. He calls his mom. He doesn't just pick up the phone to her. He actually starts to call her. He goes to parties, discovers he likes white wine, and finds out what it's like to have a bit too much of it. He has his first kiss and opens his eyes to see a pair of perfect blue ones staring back at him. He makes friends, more friends than he can count. Friends who text him asking to hang out, who help him move house, then move house again, and who fill up rows and rows of seats the day he gets married to the man he loves. The man who loves him back. Is this what it feels like? Is this happiness? Maybe, just maybe, this is it. Until one day, the man wakes up. Everything's perfect. The sun is still shining. He can hear his daughter's squeals from downstairs. His world is still happy. Except for one thing. His ear hurts. Not that much, but there's a little something. A kind of dull itch deep in his ear canal. The other ear starts to hurt as he makes his morning coffee. He should probably go to the doctor about it. He'll book that this week. But by that night, he knows he probably shouldn't wait any longer. He lies awake deep into the night feeling his lungs tightening. You're not supposed to feel your lungs, are you? 
But it's not just his lungs. It's his throat, too, and his bowels. All of a sudden, his stomach starts convulsing. He throws off the sheets and rushes into the bathroom, not quite making it to the toilet. His vomit splatters across the tiles. He must be getting delirious. That can't be right. It looks like his vomit is moving, wriggling, and crawling. His husband appears behind him, switching on the light. The two of them stare in horror at the writhing maggots covering the bathroom floor. The x-rays and MRIs paint a grueling picture. Each progressive scan over the next couple of days looks worse than the last. What had once been healthy flesh and organ tissue steadily has deeper rivets chaotically eaten into it. The maggots work their way through the man's throat, lungs, stomach, sinuses, ears, bowels, and urethra. In some places, they run out of flesh and end up burrowing their way out of the surface of his skin. By the time the maggots mature into flies, the man is on his deathbed. Excessive blood loss, organ failure, and multiple infections have worn his body down to a husk. There's nothing left to be done for him. All that the man's husband, children, mother, and countless friends can do is stand by and watch, as one by one, thousands of flies emerge from the body of the man they'd once loved so dearly. Heartbreaking as it may be, this is the sad reality of what you sign up for when you make a deal with SCP-3063, known informally as The Fly. This SCP on the surface seems like one of the most harmless that the Foundation has encountered, taking the appearance of a common house fly. It has no extraordinary physical properties, nothing apparent to distinguish it from any other fly, and yet, it is one of the most powerful entities with an apparent ability to somehow alter reality itself. It is believed that SCP-3063 only exists in one instance at a time, though this is very difficult to prove given the sheer number of flies that exist around the world. As soon as one instance of SCP-3063 dies, a new one seems to manifest in a random location. Naturally, this makes studying the fly very difficult indeed. As far as the Foundation is aware, the fly communicates with its human target telepathically. It interrogates them, trying to discover what they want most in the world. It will then offer the individual that exact thing. If they refuse, it will make increasingly grand offers, tempting them with greater and greater promises until they accept. When I said this was one of the most powerful known SCPs, I was not exaggerating, because this fly does not make empty promises. Do you want to become a millionaire? You might wake up tomorrow to a number of anonymous bank transfers or a handful of lottery tickets pushed through your letterbox. Do you want to become an opera singer? The next time you sing in the shower, you'll find a whole new voice coming from your chest. Who knows, you may have left the window open and a superstar agent could be strolling by your house at that exact moment. Whatever it is that you tell the fly that you want, it will be granted. The little insect will catch fire and die straight away, appearing somewhere else in the world, ready to start talking to someone else. Your answered wish may not always take the form you expect, but it will be given to you. Just like our student finding love everywhere he went for the next six years. Or, to be more precise, 2,376 days. You see, as soon as you make a deal with this fly, the clock is ticking. For 2,376 days, you will be free to enjoy your dream coming true, no strings attached. Until one day, you wake up with a little bit of discomfort, like something growing inside of you. Eggs, anything from 5,000 to 20,000 in number, will suddenly appear throughout your body. In your digestive system, respiratory system, and even your muscle fibers, small maggots will be born comprising all known to Terra species. They will steadily eat away at your body, feeding their way out of you and growing into regular adult flies as they emerge. Most individuals die from multiple organ failures during this stage. It can often be difficult to identify the exact cause of death as the attack on the body's central systems is so absolute, devastating, and swift. If the individual dies before the 2376th day, then the process is halted and the flies die along with them. Attempts to contain SCP-3063 have all proven unsuccessful. To date, six members of SCP Foundation personnel have been targeted by the fly. Each of them have tried to make a different wish to contain the fly, but each has had a loophole exposed. Senior researcher Elizabeth Gao requested the death of SCP-3063, which the fly interpreted as the death of that manifestation, combusted and returned in another instance. Senior researcher David Roberts asked for the permanent containment of SCP-3063. The fly then stood totally still, allowing itself to be taken into secure containment below Site-63. But sure enough, after 2,376 days, the researcher died and the fly was discovered to still be manifesting around the world it again had interpreted its containment to refer to just that current instance of its body. 
a later researcher requests knowledge of how SCP-3063 functions, at which point the fly combusted and a document containing all known information about SCP-3063, everything I am telling you now, appeared before the researcher, who later died. The penultimate test conducted by SCP personnel proved to be the most chilling. Dr. Patrick McGann asked the fly if it could provide clear, understandable knowledge of SCP-3063 other than knowledge currently possessed by the SCP Foundation. The results of that exact experiment and the next one were provided for him, including details of his own death, which he immediately fulfilled. Either the fly has some precognizant abilities or is able to directly control events in the world, or both. The final experiment was conducted even though the fly had already provided the results in detail ahead of time. Dr. Jonathan Madbury simply asked, is there even a choice, before suffering a severe pulmonary embolism and dying on the way to the hospital. Research indicates that SCP-3063 has been operating for over 4,000 years, with evidence of instances being discovered as far back as early Canaanite settlements. However, many theorize that the fly has been with us a lot longer than that. Unless future containment efforts are more successful, SCP-3063 will likely remain one of the most powerful and prolific entities outside of containment. So next time you see a fly buzzing around your room, it might be in your best interest to leave it alone. These winters are getting worse every year, that's for sure. The old cattle rancher doesn't know if it's the climate changing, God's judgment arriving, or if he's just getting older and struggling to keep up. Probably a strong mix of all of it. Whatever the cause, it doesn't change the facts. It's deathly cold out there. His ailing, elderly Ma's health continues to deteriorate. He hasn't heard from his delivery driver Orhe in days, and on top of it all, his loyal dog Marybelle is out there barking into the darkness of the barn. The rancher heads out to fetch her. He doesn't know what he'd do if she froze. He whistles, but she doesn't look back at him. She just carries on barking up that road into the snowy night. The rancher wades through the snow and peers in the direction she's looking. There's nothing there, girl. Get inside. But Mary Bell keeps barking. She's insisting. He looks again. Is that? The rancher takes off running up the road. All thoughts of cold immediately gone from his mind, he races towards the figure as fast as he can. His frozen fingers fumble at the zipper on his parka. Icy wind stabs the insides of his lungs. Mary Bell shoots off ahead of him. There, he pulls the zipper down and wrestles the thick coat off of his shoulders just as he reaches the tiny figure. He drops to his knees and throws the coat over the shoulders of the little girl standing alone in the snow. Quick as he can, he wraps it tightly around her, pulling the hood up and over her head. He takes her tiny shoulders in his hands and gives her a shake. You okay? Hello? Can you hear me? The girl sways for a moment, then collapses. He catches her, and in one deft motion, scoops her into his arms and takes off back down the road in the direction of his farm. Where the hell had she come from? There are no buildings around here for miles. No one uses that road except Jorge. And in this weather, she couldn't have walked all the way over those mountains. She'd have frozen solid. He bites the finger of a glove and pulls it off. With his bare hand, he clasps one of hers. By the feel of her skin, she pretty much is frozen solid already. He needs to get her warmed up, now. He kicks open the front door and bundles inside with a flurry of snowflakes and an anxious dog at his heels. The fire's not quite dead yet, so he rushes over to the hearth and lays the little girl down next to it. He can barely see her at all wrapped up in his enormous coat. She doesn't seem to be moving. Ma, I'm home. I, I found someone. The rancher grabs two dry logs from the side and throws them onto the fire. He piles kindling high on top of them and blows steadily into the embers at the bottom. They glow and swell in size no taking yet. He blows again for longer, and again, he feels his head starting to swim. A crackle, a lick of flame, it's taken. Panting, he turns back to the bundled up coat on the floor with the child inside. Still no movement. A sickening knot tightens his stomach. What if she's… No, don't let yourself think that. Not yet. He reaches down and gently undoes the zipper on the parka. His trembling fingers push back the hood. She's pale, deathly pale. Her dark brown hair is wet and clings to her scalp. The tips are frozen. At a guess, she must only be nine years old. Eyes closed, lips a sickening blue. But that's not the color that scares him the most. On her neck, there's red. Delicately as he can, the rancher takes the coat off her shoulders and hangs it up by the fire. She's dressed only in a plaid shirt, way too big for her. 
It looks like an adult's shirt, similar to an old one he used to have years ago. But on her neck, her hands, her feet, is that same deep red, layers of blood frozen to her skin. He sits back, his mind blank. He's seen that much blood before. Sure he has. When you work with cattle, it's an unfortunate part of the job. He's seen cows bleed out during childbirth. The girl in front of him? She's the same color as those orphaned calves that lie crying on the floor. A groaning sound fills the room. The rancher looks across at the armchair where his ma sits. She doesn't look at him, doesn't look at the girl on the floor. She just stares into the fire, same way she always does. Ma groans again, trying to express something she doesn't understand, being in a world without living in it. Ma, it's okay. Sorry if I startled you. We have a, um... We have a guest with us. But she just keeps on groaning and staring into the fire. The rancher buries his head in his hands and lets out a deep breath. Only, the sound of his breath is joined by another. A tiny breath rattling and rasping through a damaged child's throat, trying its best to keep its host alive. The rancher opens his eyes and stares at the child. She isn't conscious, not by a long shot, but she's breathing, a little at a time. The icicles in her hair have turned into rounded droplets of water that glow by the heat of the fire. He snaps back to his senses. He's not doing her much if she's just lying there soaking wet. He runs off upstairs and grabs some towels and a fresh flannel shirt to wear. After several minutes of drying her off, he's confident enough that he's got most of the water off. There's still a lot of blood caked to her skin, but as far as he can tell, there's no wound anywhere that it could have come from. Brow furrowed, he leaves her under a bundle of blankets and fills up the kettle with water. Hanging it carefully over the fire, he walks over to the cabinet and fishes out a tin of cocoa from the top shelf. Hasn't been used in years, but should still be fine. He would make it with milk, but she's probably dehydrated. Lifting the kettle's lid with the poker, the rancher pours the brown powder inside and waits for it to boil. The little girl's eyes are open now. She's staring into the flames. Her lips are looking a little more pink, her skin a little more blotchy. You're safe here. Just stay by the fire and warm up a bit. You like cocoa? The little girl drags her eyes away from the flames. Her expression is mostly blank. She looks too tired to be confused. I don't know. I think you will. Ma always gave me cocoa. Okay. And with that, the farmhouse falls silent. The little girl stares into the fire. The rancher watches her, finally feeling the wave of exhaustion crashing over him. His ma has fallen asleep in her armchair. Only Marybelle stays awake through the whole night, staying close to the little girl by the fire, occasionally licking her toes to try and warm them up. By the morning, the snow stopped, but the huge drifts remain. As the rancher walks across to the barn, he finds it hard to believe that just a few hours ago, the winds were whipping at his face as hard as they were. The world this morning is totally still. What the rancher finds even harder to believe is that there's a little girl in his house right now, fast asleep by the fire. He checked her forehead when he woke up this morning, and she miraculously hadn't caught a fever. She couldn't have been out in that weather for too long, but it only made the question more mysterious. Where did she come from? Mary Bell didn't get up this morning. From all of the excitement last night, she must have been too tired for today. Walking through the crisp morning air, he can't really blame her. He shoulders the barn door open. A column of steam curls out of the opening. All of that warmth, humidity, and cattle smell is strangely comforting this morning. But as the rancher goes around checking on all the cows inside, he very quickly discovers a problem. They're thin. Way too thin. Some of them look to be on the verge of starvation. He'd missed it last night as he drove them down in the dark, but in the warm glow of the barn's lights, it's unmistakable. These cows haven't been eating properly. He pours out several sacks of grain for them into the troughs, and they all gather around hungrily, filling both their stomachs as fast as they can. The rancher leans on the railing for a moment, confused. Even in this cold, there was still plenty of green grass for them up on the ridge. That's why he'd taken them up there. They should have had no trouble eating until the snow came in last night. He doesn't like this one bit. Last time Orge had driven down and collected some of the meat, he'd had a few questions about the quantity being smaller than usual. Were the cows sick at all? Not that the rancher could tell. But now, looking at them, it's clear as day. Something's up. You hungry? The little girl nods. They sit across the table from one another, eating homemade bread and soup. Ma stays over by the fire. Mary Bell slowly wanders over to the kitchenette and flops down on the floor, exhausted. Where are you from? The girl shrugs her shoulders. You know how you got out here? Remember anything from last night? The little girl just eats her soup and shakes her head. She doesn't look particularly scared or worried. 
just a little confused. Where are your parents? Do you have parents? Again, the little girl shrugs. The rancher sits back and folds his arms. He's tried to call into town, but his phone line's gone out in the blizzard. Not much to be done until the snow clears. He's got a good relationship with the police around here. If he explains the situation, then it'll all be okay. What do you know? Can you remember anything from last night? It was dark. The girl slurps her soup. I was hungry. So hungry. Then I saw the light and I went towards that. My car? No. Well, yes, later on it was your car, but before it wasn't. What was the light then? Where were you? I don't know. It was just... the light. Now he's even more confused, but try as he might, the rancher can't figure any of it out, and try as she might, the little girl can't remember anything more precise than that. The pair of them hop into the car and drive back out up the road that afternoon. The snow is piled so high that the rancher is having to get out twice as often as he did the previous night to clear a track for them. He isn't actually sure what he's brought her out here looking for. Clues, maybe? He almost laughs at himself at the thought, but that's probably the best word for it. If he can figure out how she got here, then he can work on understanding who she is and how to get her home. There's the damage to the phone line. One of the masts has collapsed, sagging heavily on the lines. That's not something he can fix on his own. No, sir. Looks like he'll have to wait for the snow to melt before making any phone calls again. That could be in one week. That could be in three months. He glances at the child sitting in the passenger seat. She's just staring out of the window in amazement, wrapped up in as many layers as he could put on her. They may be stuck together for a while. A lurch. The pickup plunges dangerously to the left. The rancher slams on the brakes and it comes to a stop just in time. A large chunk of snow in front of them comes loose and slips off the side of the road. It tumbles down into a gully that he hadn't even spotted. With all this snow on the ground, he has no frame of reference. Everything is just white. Stay here. The rancher opens the door and climbs out. He wishes Marybell was with him, but she'd wanted to stay home again. Poor dog. She must really be going through it if she wasn't even up for a ride in the pickup. Carefully as he can, testing every step before making it, the rancher creeps over to the edge of the gully. It's bigger than he thought, much bigger. It continues down, more and more sharply for a few hundred feet, all the way down into a... Oh no. There's a semi down there. A big rig, warped and bent, lying on the rocks. Just a glance is enough to tell the rancher it's Orges, but he just keeps staring at it in disbelief. Can't be. It... But it is. Stay in the car. The rancher reaches past the little girl and into the back seat. Grabbing a pair of crampons and some rope, he straightens up and looks at the girl. She knows it's serious. He can see the concern on her face. Stay in the car, he repeats. By the time the rancher makes it down to the truck, his legs and back are killing him. All this work over the last 24 hours is going to start taking its toll sooner or later, but some things have to be done. He pauses by the semi. It's on its side. He'll have to climb up onto it and try to open the door. Some things have to be done. He hoists himself up and manages to clamber onto the metal door. It's badly crumpled, and the window is smashed in. He doesn't fancy his chances of being able to get it open. One look through the window shows him that he won't want to do that anyway. Blood coats every inch of the inside of Orge's truck. The cabin that the rancher is so used to seeing and sitting in is almost unrecognizable. Smashed glass is sprinkled across every surface with a dark brownish red layer of gore frozen into everything else. There, in the midst of it all, still wearing a seatbelt, is Orge's body. It dangles like a limp carcass at a butcher shop, like the cows he hangs in the slaughterhouse. And like those cows, a large chunk of Orge is missing. His fat stomach is gone, not just cut open, but gone. The tops of his thighs, too, and much of his chest. So much of him is just missing. Open arteries and lifeless nerves dangle in place. That must have been a hell of a crash. The rancher reaches over and pulls Orge's cap down over his eyes. Not much else to be done right now. No way he can clean this mess up by himself. But as the rancher climbs up the valley, his mind starts to connect some dots. Dots that leave a sick feeling in his stomach. He's seen that much blood somewhere else. Or rather, on someone else, just last night. He slams the door to the pickup shut and starts to drive back down the track. Since the snow stopped, all of the drifts that he'd cleared earlier remain clear. It's only a few minutes' drive back down to the farm. He doesn't say a word the whole way, and neither does the little girl. She clearly senses something's up. The sick feeling in his stomach remains. He pulls up the handbrake, and the two of them sit in silence outside the farmhouse. 
There's a truck in that valley. Did you know that? Yes. Is that where you came from last night? I don't remember. Was he... The rancher stops. Jorge didn't have any kids. What were you doing in his truck? I don't know. Did he... Was he... The rancher can't bring himself to accuse his best friend of the words that almost left his mouth. Do you think you might not remember because something bad happened to you? I don't know. The rancher closes his eyes for a long moment. Silence fills the pickup. Come on, let's get inside. But inside wasn't the safe haven he'd been hoping for. Ma's been throwing up, not just once, but a few times. She's distressed, groaning aimlessly for someone to come and save her. Marybelle is pacing around the room, yelping and whining. The rancher immediately goes upstairs to get some rags to clean up with. Perfect timing, as usual. But he stops in his tracks when he comes back down. His ma has stopped moaning. The little girl is kneeling by the armchair, holding the old lady's hand. The room is calm. The little girl gently places the frail hand back on the armrest and comes over to take the rags from the rancher. Returning to the old lady, the girl goes about mopping her up as best she can. Marybelle slumps back down on the floor. And that is how the four of them exist for the next few days. Ma gets sicker steadily, but the little girl stays by her side all day long, caring for her in every way. The rancher's glad of that. It gives him the time he needs to help his cows outside. None of them are in a good shape. Whatever it is, they're still getting thinner. He feeds them all the grain they'd normally need, and then some, and they always finish it off. Yet none of them are getting any fatter. The rancher leans on the railing, trusty dog by his side. His energy is starting to really lag behind what he needs. The last couple of days, even though he hasn't done all that much, have totally taken it out of him. Who do you think it is, Mary Bell? He looks down at his little friend. She's looking thinner too, actually, but she's been eating just fine. It hits him. Tapeworms. As soon as the word comes into his head, it makes total sense. His cows, his entire herd by the looks of things, have been riddled with tapeworms. Ah, oh, hell. He hasn't got anywhere near the amount of medicine needed to give some to all of them. Even if he did, a lot of them are looking pretty far gone. The chance of reinfection would be high. He needs supplies. He needs Orhe. Marybelle whines softly next to him. He knows what they have to do. Laying Marybelle down carefully by the fire, the rancher administers the tapeworm medicine. For a few hours, they lie there together. He strokes her side, waiting for her to pass it. The little girl watches over his shoulder. His ma sits back in her chair, mumbling to herself. He hasn't talked to the little girl anymore about Orhe yet. He isn't sure what there is to say. Maybe he should ask if Orhe was sick. After all, the cows clearly have had these tapeworms since before the other night. Orhe may have picked up contaminated meat from him last time he came. Maybe... Marybelle passes the worm on the rug. Ugh, the smell. The rancher uses the tongs next to the fire to pick the worm up. It's long and pale. And dead. He tosses it into the fire and puts the tongs in the flames for a bit to sterilize them. The worm sizzles and pops in the flames. The sound makes his stomach crawl. The rancher glances around and sees the little girl staring at the tapeworm. He looks past the girl to his ma sitting in the chair. Her turn next. But as that night and the following morning reveal, it's too late. His ma's groans turn into cries of pain. She openly sobs by the fire, clutching at her stomach. Every time the rancher tries to give her the medicine, she just vomits it back up. Each time she vomits, there's more and more blood mixed in. The little girl gets more and more upset. It's not fair on her to have to witness something this traumatic and disgusting. But there's nowhere else for her to go. She shouldn't even be here at all. The fact that she is means she has to help. That's all there is to it. By sunrise, his ma has passed away. There is nasty red bruising all across her abdomen, which tells him she must have bled out internally from this worm. He'd been too late to realize what was wrong. Too late with the cows, and too late with his ma. He covers his ma with a blanket, and tells the little girl not to go and wash her hands. He needs to check on the cattle. Sure enough, during the night, a handful of them died too. The calves. They were the ones to go first whenever something like this happened. Mother cows stood over their calves, licking their heads, willing them to wake up. The rancher drags each body out to the back and burns them. He can't risk any more contamination. As the carcasses burn, he allows himself to cry. But when the rancher comes back into the house, it's full of noise, a noise that takes his brain a long time to comprehend. Crying, but not his own, not the little girl either. No, it was a new sound. It was a baby, a newborn child screaming at the top of its lungs. 
The rancher can't believe what he's looking at. The little girl is sitting at the hearth with Marybelle at her feet. In her arms, drenched in blood, is a baby. The girl looks up at him and smiles sweetly. It's a boy. Then, she turns around to his ma's body under the blanket. A sickening red patch soaks through the fabric, right over where her stomach would be. What the hell happened here? I've got a little brother. Securing and containing SCP-1003 has proven… challenging. This is largely because the tapeworm that causes all of this damage is virtually indistinguishable from Echinococcus granulosus, the common variety of tapeworm that causes hydatid disease. The tapeworm, designated SCP-1003-1, follows the same life cycle as other regular worms. Its eggs come into contact with an animal through contaminated meat, saliva, or unclean surfaces and are ingested. Once inside the gut, they grow and latch onto the inside of the digestive tract, where they feed on the nutrients of the food traveling past them, steadily growing bigger and stronger. Once mature, they lay eggs, which pass out in the animal's excrement to continue the process. Infections spread quickly, particularly in unsanitary conditions amongst livestock, and can often be difficult to contain, as by the time the symptoms – nausea, weight loss, fever – start to manifest in the infected, the worms have likely already reproduced and have a new generation growing in the guts of other animals. As far as the Foundation is aware, SCP-1003 follows this normal pattern in all observed animals except humans. When a human ingests an egg from this tapeworm, a very different creature starts to grow in their gut. Human embryos, with the same genetic code as the tapeworm, begin to form. The rate of their growth is greatly accelerated, however. By just eight weeks, they are as mature as the typical three-week-old neonate or newborn child, although similar in size to an eight-week-old embryo at 13 to 16 centimeters. Many eggs usually enter this fertilization period, but almost all of them die before having a chance to develop much beyond the early stages. They stand the best chance of survival when buried in the hepatic tissue, where they can absorb plenty of nutrients from their host. The host at this point usually starts to experience mild symptoms – lethargy, the occasional stomach cramp, nothing particularly severe. Yet, the embryos that survive soon develop rows of temporary, razor-sharp teeth. At this point, passively absorbing nutrients is no longer enough for them. They bury their teeth into the soft tissue surrounding them and begin to eat. Once they enter this stage, their rate of growth increases exponentially the more flesh they consume. Eventually burrowing out into the world, the tapeworm child is born drenched in blood. The size and apparent age of the child that emerges from the corpse are determined by the size of the person they consume. For example, the child eating its way out of the rancher's maw appeared to be only a ten-month-old child, as there was very little of the frail old woman for it to eat. By contrast, the little girl who emerged from Orhe's gut had plenty of fat to feast on and so was able to grow to the size of a nine-year-old. Once the child emerges, the teeth that they'd used to eat their way out quickly become loose and are replaced by regular human teeth. The children themselves have no memory at all of where they've come from or what they are. They have the same motor and linguistic skills that a regular child would possess at their age. Nothing, aside from their DNA, marks them out as being any different from the children around them, blissfully ignorant, just like the children around them. It is theorized that many of these children end up in orphanages. With no birth certificates or identifiable parents, they fall through the gaps in the system, quickly lost to the world. The only way to really track them at all is to follow the infections they cause. You see, these tapeworm children have one final curse they must live with. Their bodily fluids, their saliva, and sweat contain the same tapeworm protoscolex that will develop into SCP-1003-1 as soon as it is ingested by another creature, making the cycle start all over again. If you want to track down a tapeworm child, and I highly advise that you don't, all you have to do is follow the trail of nasty stomach infections, internal bleeding, and freak pregnancies amongst the outcasts of society. It, unfortunately, will not take long. There are currently ten instances of SCP-1003-2 in containment. The children live in Bioresearch Area 13 under strict supervision. Researchers are only permitted to enter their cells whilst wearing full-body biohazard suits, but first must have Level 4 security clearance and must have written permission and can only enter with specific research goals agreed upon. All staff are regularly tested for the presence of any kind of tapeworms in their system. No other animals are permitted in this facility. If you want to support Dr. Bob while also getting influence over the anomalies we cover and an exclusive look behind the scenes, check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry, such as SCP-2119, Transmitting Parasite, 
for more Perilous Parasites. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.